All right, I'm going to call to order Board of Education study session January 16, 2020. Secretary, take attendance. All board members are present. Okay, first we have public comment. Uh, we have, uh, not during the study session. So, um, Catherine. Hi. Hi. I'm Catherine Danishvar, co-chair of the Multicultural Celebration, along with Leah Abel. On behalf of the entire Multicultural Committee, including Board President Paul Colin and many others around this room, we would like to invite you to the district-wide Multicultural Celebration on Monday, March 30th, 5.30 to 8 p.m. This is a family-friendly event Students K through 12th grade are welcome to come with their families and represent their own culture, a different culture, or just discover something for fun. This year's theme is Legends and Stories. All school and district listservs should showcase a flyer <coughs> and, and uh, slide, ex explanatory slideshow, so please be on the lookout for, for more information. The celebration will also be showcasing a multicultural book fair so that you can enrich your home library with diverse and hard to find books for your own personal library as well as donate to schools of your choice. There will also be a lot of food and we are happy to be sharing food from all, all over the world. We're happy to share a meal representing some different cultures and regions around the world. There is no cost to attend. Please consider contributing your own chosen culture, historical culture, or something that you would like to discover with us at this event. In case that you can't, please consider supporting the district-wide multicultural celebration <coughs> just by attending as a community member. Please save the date for Monday, March 30th, 530 to 8, for entertainment, grabbing a book, or having lots of good food. Thank you. Any more public comment? More public comment? Uh, so we're going to go into our agenda shortly. And just to reemphasize, I know I put this out on social media. This is a board study session. So the only attempt for anyone out there to talk would be during public comment. I'm happy after we go through. Um, our scope and design talking about the bond in detail to make an amendment to our agenda to add another public comment if people want to have comments after we go through that part as well. It's an interaction just as you saw um, Catherine you know you're able to speak for up to five minutes but we as board members cannot comment back to you so just to let everyone know that. With that before we go into scope and design I know this is our first uh, official meeting uh, with our new superintendent Pat Watson so I know Pat wanted to say a few words. Thank you. Um, just a couple minutes, just want to say thank you to the board, to central office, staff, students, community members, and the parents I met along the way. It's been great seeing so many familiar faces, meeting so many new people. I to say I'm excited to be here in Bloomfield Hills is an understatement. This is a dream job. It's a job better than anywhere else in the nation as far as I'm concerned, and I can't wait to serve you in the best way possible. Thank you. Okay. With that, we're going to go into the first item that um, in the study session, which is our scope and design discussions and recommendations. So I know we have some people here <coughs> that are going to present to the board. Um, so you guys can help to come up and start doing your presentation. And then after the presentation, we'll hold you know all questions unless they're relevant until probably after they go through their presentations. So I know several board members has has some questions that we we have. Um, that we need to ask you guys. I'd like to start by saying good evening and good evening. thank you and everyone for showing up to my birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, just to recognize that there are several scope and design committee members in the audience and uh, three of the board members are here as well. So here we go. So the why are we here tonight? We've been on quite a journey in Bloomfield Hills over the past few years. Um, different committees that many of us have served on, and when I say many of us, uh, community members, teachers, administrators uh, throughout the district, uh, been a part of the middle school study group that took place a couple years ago. 
Uh, we've had our K-8 facilities moonshot thinking group meet and, and go on some field trips and study different aspects of education uh, and, and how facilities enhance education. And additionally, the strategic planning committee that met over the past year and many of those findings uh, and recommendations from the strate strategic plan uh, involve the community spaces and the facilities that we have to provide education for our students. Um, and really, you can see the different focus areas uh, depending on which group uh, of, the, of the groups I just referenced, those are really the same names as whether we call them buckets, focus areas, it all came down to, to these kind of categories here that are in front of you. And we're going to go into quite a bit of detail on each of these focus areas as we go through the presentation. So a little bit of history, and I know we've been through this uh, several times with many of you, but um, Andy and I have decided to <coughs> break like every presentation rule. We have way too many slides and we're going to read a whole bunch to you, but we want to make sure that everyone captures the detail and um, we know that this is going to get viewed uh, several times. So uh, about two and a half years ago, we started our facility and technology audit and about a year ago, we presented to the board um, some options and we identified $33 million in critical needs. We told the board not to panic. We could manage the decline through the sinking fund, which is represented by the stop sign. And if we did that, we would have more than $33 million in critical needs at that point because of things coming offline as we went along. We also talked about the road closed. If, if we were to pass a bond or come up with $33 million and we put that money into our infrastructure and into our facilities the way they were configured, then what would we do? The road would really be closed. You're not going to start tearing apart those buildings that we just put that money into. And um, we also talked to the board about a bright future ahead. And we've talked about numbers of 130 to $190 million. And the board asked us to explore that. So the last year, we've done that. So how would, how would we end up um, resolving all of those issues? And we worked with the Scope and Design Committee. We had several different concepts. Um, we just presented this to you a few weeks ago. But basically, we end up with two middle schools. Um, a North Middle School at the Losser site, a South Middle School at the Bloomfield Hills Middle School site, four K-5 elementary schools, Lone Pine at West Hills, East Hover at East Hills, Conant and Way stay in the same locations with uh, major renovations and additions. Then two preschools, one at Conant that would service that telegraph corridor and one at East Hover which would service the east side. And that's what this would look like. Um, as you can see just from the graphic, um, you've got preschools, you've got the 4K5s, and then you have the Bloomfield Hills Middle School South, which has feeder schools of the Lone Pine and Conant buildings, and uh, the North, which is um, fed by Way and East Over. And one of those challenges that we have. Could you just go back one? Sure. And one of the challenges that we do face is the imbalance in population with our current elementary catchments. So the, the map you see is our current Bloomfield Hills Schools map and the different colors are our four elementary boundaries that, that currently exist. Um, there is an imbalance anywhere from I think the low 400s to the low 700s depending on, on where you're at when I'm talking about K-5 elementary students. So one of the things that we need to be looking at um, and one of the things that is a big part of this plan and was considered by our scope and design committee was uh, looking at how to balance the populations equally amongst the four elementary catchment areas. Uh, the graphic you see in front of you here is a pulled apart map so you can see those four different distinct areas as they currently exist and the example up there is just one of, of many ways we could uh, move students to in order to, to get to that number of about 550 per elementary school, which would be our K-5 student population. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's numerous ways to go about doing that. Again, this is something that is just one demonstration of how that could be accomplished. When was the last time we changed catchment areas? Ooh, that, that's a good question. I think it would have been with the closure of Hickory Grove and Pine Lake is when we was the last time that we did we had, change catchment areas or we just realigned we, the we we had to change I 
believe because we were we were you going know. from six elementaries to four, so we had to uh, determine okay. where where the students from Hickory Grove and, and and Pine Lake actually ended up. I'm just thinking off the cuff here, uh, having been at uh, Lone Pine West Hills at that time, um, all of the Pine Lake. I don't think boundaries changed for Lone Pine. Pine Lake it was just added to Lone Pine. Hickory Grove. I'm not as well versed. In. Some some to East Over, some to. Some went to East Over, some went to Way. So that would have been, but but. So Conant didn't Conan, change. I don't believe Conan changed in all of that. Was a very minor number of uh, okay. changes. Okay. Prior to that, I had no idea. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So safety and security. Um, this program would include constructing secure entries, improved traffic patterns, installing window safety film in select locations, install fire sprinkler systems install video surveillance, upgrade access control, install visitor management systems, upgrade entrance intercoms, and upgrade district-wide public address systems. So all the buildings would then have sally ports? So we will go over that in the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and the, this first part here is gonna show you those, those different focus areas, more of like a general overview for the entire scope of the project. And then as Brian referenced, each building it's going to be a bulleted list as to how each of those uh, impact each of those buildings. So from an academic lens here, we would be looking to improve the classroom environments. Uh, that would involve installing classroom interactive displays and sound systems, upgrading technology infrastructure, up updating architectural components, improving the lighting and indoor air quality, um, creating STEM and collaborative work environments in, throughout the buildings, and upgrade and enhance media, media centers. Is, um, is, there, is there talk about getting, because uh, I think the two hardest technology places right now, ironically enough, I think it's Lasser and BHMS, is, is are we going to work and try to get towers there, cell towers there, or how are we going to improve that aspect of it? Um, so you're referring to not necessarily technology, but cell yeah, reception. Cell, cell, cell. Um, so we've just begun uh, communicating with the township about the district's um, wanting to have improved cell coverage as part of our safety and security plan. So those discussions have begun. Because okay. you also, at this, we're going from 4G to 5G as a country, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure how that all, because the 5G technology is totally different from the 4G uh, cell tower implementation. Art, arts was a part of one of those other focus areas. Um, when you look at the elementary schools, uh, all of them would have performance stages. When you look East, East Hills and West Hills buildings would be used, so they have existing stages, those multi-purpose rooms, you'll, as you'll see in the individual uh, call-outs of, of what's happening at each building. Uh, there'd be increased seating capacity and, and improved art and music rooms at the elementary schools. Uh, the middle school north, you would have a renovated auditorium that is an existing structure right now that would receive renovation. You'd have band, orchestra, and choir room improvements. And again, those are existing rooms currently that would be improved. And we'd be creating a new art room with some of the existing space that, it, that is currently at the Lasser site, but it would be a completely brand new um, art room. At the Middle School South, you'd have this newly constructed multi-purpose auditorium, which you'll see a little bit more detail on later in this presentation. And additionally, uh, brand new art and music rooms at that location. So athletic, uh, the elementary schools would get physical education space improvements, middle school synthetic turf fields, which would include um, Bloomfield Hills Middle School South, um, middle school north practice fields, um, which are there currently, uh, middle school and community educational pool, education pool located at the north middle school, high school uh, fitness addition, high school baseball and softball turf fields, and improve outdoor concessions and bathrooms. And another big part, uh, this definitely came out of our strategic plan as well as having more community spaces, um, which obviously would enhance activities within the district as well. So you're looking at that middle school community education pool, which would be located at the North Middle School on the Lasser site. A district career exploration center, which really would encompass STEM, robotics, and, and other career opportunities. <coughs> and again, that would be at the North Middle School. Farm expansion for new community experiences. 
nature, and, nature center enhancements for new community experiences. Uh, grass park space possibilities, when you think about some of the buildings that would be coming offline, it's going to open up some, some green space within the community as well and provide for some, some park uh, uh, possibilities. And then enhanced spaces for family rec recreation and performances in schools. Again, just thinking about the number of stages that we'll have for the performing arts within our, within our district. Uh, groups like Bloomfield Players who are currently renting out different spaces within our district would have many options as well as obviously other community groups as well. And then additionally, it's all about uh, providing opportunities for all of our learners. And so a big part of this was designing inclusive and equitable spaces for all learners. So when you look at ADA and special education, um, a huge focus throughout this project and, and throughout the process is really looking at improving our ADA accessibility, creating barrier-free spaces, access to playgrounds, um, and, and obviously every educational opportunity for all students um, should, should be there. Uh, improve special education learning spaces, create new sensory rooms, and create new therapy rooms. So we were really looking at, um, as, we're, as we're in the general design in this project, um, knowing that all of these are going to be key components to make sure that all learners are included. So now we're going to take a deep dive and repeat a lot of what we just said, but very specific for each building. So the project list for Conant Elementary School. Create secure entry vestibule, security upgrades, multi-purpose room addition, create STEM collaboration spaces, upgrade and enhance media center, classroom additions, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, classroom architectural improvements, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, roof replacement, technology infrastructure, audio visual systems, update <coughs> classroom technology, furniture replacement, construct sensory room, and barrier free playground. And before we jump there, I just wanna point out when you're looking at each of these um, models, these, these conceptual designs of what Conant would look like and as we move through all the other buildings, it's important to look at that key. The purple color is our additions that would be um, constructed at, at a location. The darker blue is heavy renovation, the lighter blue is moderate renovation, and the green is light renovation. So, and that, that theme will continue as you look at each of these models. Before we move on, so can we go back to that question I asked earlier? You're talking, you have a secure entry vestibule. I know the term a sally port. Is that the same thing? Uh, yes. And the maybe term, you can explain what a sally port is. Yeah, and then so the is term that sally port really is not being used anymore. Oh, okay. Um, but a sec the secure entry vestibule is a way for a person to enter um, like an airlock and then proceed into the office space before being able to access the rest of the building. And, and that's then, what my concept was of a sally port. Why is sally port not being used anymore? Um, I, I used it the other day and I was corrected. I Googled it and I don't remember what it said. But. Okay, but basically, it's, so it's, it's going through. Yes. You have going, to bypass. You don't go straight from door to door. Correct. You have to go through the office and then go, you exit from the office into the building. That's correct. Thank you. Secure entry. Um, for the Conant site, um, we're for making it one of the two preschool centers. I don't see anything in this plan that shows enhanced space for preschool. Um, preschool's coming up. Oh, separately. Okay. Yeah, when you look where the art room is on this drawing, you can see a little hallway that's still open-ended. You'll see a little connection to that when we get to the preschool slide. So, so on each of these, and I say it's, so it's going to cost what we're going to do to, to cone it $16 million. Is that what that means? That's correct. Now, will you also be showing how the campus in uh, concept of Conant and BH kind of interrelate? Because remember, there was a whole discussion yeah. about changing the driveways yes. and the entrances. And I don't know that we have a graphic for that, Howard, but that concept is still there. Okay. Yeah. Change up voices on the microphone here, Brian and I are going to alternate as it's a lot of reading of bullet points. Um, Way Elementary, again, kind of similar to what Conant uh, is as far as the design goes. It's one of our two existing elementary schools. So when you look at that, you have, again, the create, create a secure entry vestibule, a multi-purpose room addition, create STEM collaboration spaces, 
upgrade and enhance media center, classroom addition, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, classroom architectural improvements, security upgrades, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, technology infrastructure, audio visual systems, update classroom technology, furniture replacement, construct sensory room, and again, that barrier free playground. What, what, how, why is way um, less expensive than Conan? Is it the, the parking lot part of it? And I'm also wondering if the preschool is being, you know, budgeted or estimated separately. So there's four million, is it just that it needed less renovation or? So just, um, you know, I have uh, like 70 pages of detail, so okay. I don't have this all memorized, but um, if you look at, there's six new classrooms at Conant, there's, okay. um, looks like five new classrooms at Way. Um, so it's just differences within the site and within the, the current condition of the building. and. and and you know projects that have been done through the sinking fund affect what needs to be done at these it, buildings as it, well. Is the idea when you look at all four elementary schools is to make it very very similar? Is that I mean re, you know regardless of the cost, is way will look like not exactly, but whatever additional spaces and I guess I, I'm seeing that from the the bullet points, they all will have the same advantage. Yes, nothing will be different. And, and yes, wise as well, they'll be the similar. Um, them. They'll be similar with uh, Way and Conant. Obviously, uh, East over at East Hills right. and uh, Lone Pine at West Hills is going to have a larger footprint. Okay. When all these buildings were built in the 50s and 60s, so when a number of us were actually growing up. Lots of things have happened since then, and we're now in 21st century education. You look at the high school, you have learning communities, totally different concept than cells and bells like we we're all used to. How are these, the spending, A, really getting us prepared for, or evolving us from 20th century to 21st century education in the middle, of elementaries and middles, number one, and how are these investments going to improve academic achievement. Well, that's part of this whole session. Should we get through and see this whole thing first and then we yes. can address yes. this as a whole thing? Okay. Yeah, and just to speak briefly to that, when you look at when you <coughs> look at Way and Conant, um, looking at some of the spaces that are created, you're looking at some of those collaborative spaces that didn't exist with the I forget the, the term cells and cells and bells. Cells, cells and bells, there you go. So um, you know, when you're looking at this, you can see some things where we're converting a gym to a media center, perhaps. Uh, the old media center has STEM opportunities. Um, at the elementary level, you see still more defined classrooms and maybe not as much collaboration space, sending second graders down the hallway to the opposite side of the school to work in a, in a particular area maybe isn't the best practice. But I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Bank in terms of let's go through it all and then we'll have the questions later. Sure, okay. So um, East Hills, uh, it's labeled as East Hills Elementary School. That would be East Over Elementary School at the East Hills site. Um, you'd be creating a secure entry vestibule, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, classroom architectural improvements, security <coughs> upgrades, roof replacement, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, technology infrastructure, audio visual systems, update classroom technology, furniture replacement, barrier-free playground, and construct a sensory room. And as you can see, there's no, no purple on this particular building because the space that we currently have, it's utilizing the assets that we have within the district in this design. So, mm -hmm. sorry, for, for all of them, I, I see construct sensory room. Can you just, a little bit of detail, what, what do you mean by a sensory room? Um, again, looking at the inclusivity piece, looking at the needs of, of each individual learner, um, oftentimes, uh, having a, a sensory room gives a kid an opportunity to uh, regain focus and, 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 need that, and get the break that they need based on their individual needs. Um, and so there's very specific guidelines, and my special ed colleagues could talk in much more detail about that. Um, but it is one of, those, one of those resources that is best practice to have in place. And um, again, having that as we're going through the design, be a part of the design, we're going to be able to meet our need, the needs of, our, of all of our learners. Okay. 
So East Hills had fourth and fifth. Now it's going to have K through five. Correct. So some of these rooms are reallocating the fourth and fifth grade classrooms, and some of them are actually, sounds like, well, possibly with the addition, reallocating or moving some of the middle school classrooms and becoming K3? <clears throat> yes, when you look at the, the level of renovation, when you look at that wing that's at uh, lighter blue, uh -huh. that currently is a foods room, um, a Spanish classroom, an art room, um, <coughs> and I think a special education classroom. As we analyze this with architects, uh, that became, it became clear that square footage with kindergarten classrooms, that really made sense to, to, to perhaps turn that wing into a kindergarten wing of the building. Um, and so when you see the lighter blue, it's moderate renovation. So it's going to be a little bit more significant than what you'd see in the bulk of the building because those are currently functioning classrooms that the footprint is the right footprint for an elementary classroom. And you can go through the, the renovations of, of new casework, flooring, lighting, um, and that would be considered light renovation when you're just kind of scrubbing the surfaces and, and putting in new casework. Did I say that right, Mr. Facilities? Yeah, pretty much. Um, just a little more detail. So the, the light renovation, those classrooms will feel like brand new classrooms. The front of the classroom is going to be new, casework will be new, paint will be new, ceilings and lighting will be new, flooring will be new, and any reconfiguration that needs to happen can happen. When you talk about turning an art room into a kindergarten room, that's moderate renovation. All those same things will happen that I just mentioned. Plus, you need to put in a bathroom for the kindergarten kids. Plus, you're tearing out and repurposing that room. Um, and please remember, for all of you and everyone that's watching at home or sitting behind me, this is all conceptual work. And this is to put a budget number together. And the design will happen once the bond passes, when we work with our staff and our parents and our administrators to really detail and hammer out what these spaces look like. So, so you're saying, because I know this is one of the questions we got from the community, so you're saying you will eventually be collaborating with whether it's teachers in the buildings on what they should look like based on their feedback and parents, et cetera. You know, this will be less sort of like a ballpark and then you'll be tweaking it based on that. That's is that correct. the question? Well, okay. So why do that? Why not do some of, obviously we don't care, or the community doesn't care about where the, the outlets go in the building and the colors, but why not discuss this with the teachers and the community now and get a more concrete design so that we can really fully explain it to the community of exactly what we're getting? Well, I can answer that in a few different ways. One, um, people that were involved in what you're looking at now work with our teachers and work with our community and our community members that are sitting behind us that had input into what this configuration looks like, as well as the bulk of architectural fees, which is obviously required by law, um, are in design. And we would be spending general fund money to design something that we didn't know if we were going to build or not. Because by doing the design later, you run the risk of budget overruns. <coughs> And if you have a more concrete design now, you're more certain about exactly the dollars that you're asking for and run less of a risk. I mean, obviously, when you tear things down, you'll always find very likely hidden concrete and things like that. But in terms of change orders and things like that that go on in a construction project, you would have a lot less because you have a lot more of the definition of exactly what you want already on the table. Uh, Howard, what they said was is that the architectural um, costs are significant. They're yep. millions of dollars. We have to yeah. be well, able that could to... Be, that's our choice, though, as a board in terms of do we put that investment before and, and then right. pay ourselves right. back I, I, through the bond. That's, I think that's, it's, that's, I, that's an option we have. No, I think it's on the table now. You, yeah. you raised the question. He answered it. I think we kind of know. I, I also want to make clear, I mean, I've toured the building several times with Brian. I, I know that there has been teacher feedback and collaboration mm -hmm. with both of you. Uh, I, you pointed stuff out to me that was the suggestion of teachers that I, I just want people to think that there hasn't been that part of it already that has happened. That's, I mean, I don't think we'd be here if it wasn't for all the all teacher I'm trying feedback to do is, that we've gotten. Is minimize the change um, orders that we get after the fact. Well, let's not forget that this whole conversation started about academics. 
and a large part of the conversation was scope and design and where the conversation started with scope and design was all about academics and the reality of the situation and there's a lot of different moving parts here but the reality of the situation was this school district with its population going forward can no longer academically support three middle schools just by way of example and some of you have heard this but this is also being televised so to the extent you have three middle schools that have 10 kids in band at one, 10 in band at the other, and 10 in band at the other. You can't run band with 10 kids. You can't run French with 10 kids at each school. And we'll end up cutting programs that where if we put kids together in the right size schools, now we'll have maybe 20 kids for band at one, 20 right. at the other, or, and enough kids to run a football team, and enough kids to do this project and that language and all of that. So in order to get to that point, you need the two right middle schools. We looked at, should we be one middle school? Should we be two middle schools? Should we be three middle schools? And ultimately, from an educational perspective, it was the scope and design committee, which was included educators, community members, board members, people from all walks of life in this community, came to the recommendation that we should be a two middle school district to best educate our students. From there, the question then became to get the right numbers of kids in those buildings then where on the elementary school, this 550, we talked about going to three elementary schools, six elementary schools, and looked at the right numbers for all of that and came up with 550 was the right size to provide the best educational opportunities for the district, for the kids in the district. But in order to do that, you had to have the right buildings. And then it went to the, con then we got to structure. So this was all about education first. And then we got to the point, well, you could spend 30 or $40 million to take your 1955 Buick and make it a nice shiny 1955 Buick, but two years from now, it's still gonna be a 1955 Buick that has the limitations of that, that doesn't provide you what you need, not only in 2020, but in 2070. So this is kind of a multi-generational task we're looking at, is how to best provide for this community educationally. And let's not lose sight of that. This, we're talking about bricks and mortar tonight, but these guys spent a ton of time, and a lot of other people spent a ton of time, and I'm not tasking you, I'm just filling in a blank that I think was left out on the slide that talked about stop and slow down and the path forward. We spent a lot of time as a board going through the academics and the, the financial and how to make this the best academic structure for the district, and then now how do we build it to support that? And rather than you know demolishing everything and starting over with six you know new you know shiny buildings, we're able to take a lot of what we have and repurpose, reconfigure, and do all that. And a lot of time, going to your point, was spent going through estimations of costs. If you do it this way, if you do it that way, if you do it that way, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but to build every piece of it out in advance, I think is nearly an impossible. Well, no, I, th I, th I, th I, th I think, Mark, you made a wonderful point. What you just did is laid out the business case. And one of the, some of the questions that were in our packet that we put together over the last couple of weeks at our president's uh, request is what are the issues, what are the problems you know, I'm just reading my thing, including a comprehensive SWOT analysis that we have currently and over the next few years, student achievement, curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. What you just said is exactly what we need to document in a very concise way in three, five, ten slides, whatever it is, so that it's very obvious from a person who doesn't know anything about this. This is not for the board, this is for the community. So we all understand as an organization before we go forward as to what the issues are and how this spending of money is gonna resolve those issues. But that's respectfully, perfect. we've spent a lot of time and that's all been done and all of us right. that are sitting here at this table have done that at extensive yeah. meetings. I have not seen it to the well, extent. I've been sitting next to you at those meetings. It, it, excuse me, I have the all right, microphone. All right, I'm, so I'm just gonna bring this back when we go to the presentation. The one thing I will say, in doing some diligence on other bonds, whether it's the Ann Arbor million dollars, whether it's billion dollars, billion, do billion dollars, whether it's 190 million for Birmingham and other districts that have done it, and we've asked you guys to do, they have not gone into this level of detail, and we're trying to get as much detail as possible. We can get to the electrical. We're not no, going to get I, I there. Don't, I don't want to. So don't I, go I think close let's to go that. back to the but presentation. On, what, what's being lost a little bit here? Oh. This may be the first time that some of us are seeing the exact diagrams of yep. how we might 
pull this off facility-wise. But make no mistake about it, from an educational standpoint, we have spent an awful lot of time, and these guys and their colleagues have spent an awful lot of time analyzing this and coming to, I won't say conclusions, but very strong recommendations. I'm, I'm not disputing that at all. What I'm but saying is it, taking all that knowledge that we've worked on for a year or two and actually putting it into my point's a presentation Howard. so we can understand but it. The public and shouldn't think, it, but let them finish the one that The public let shouldn't us, think us that, that we're, that we're just I'm thinking just about this tonight for the first for. time. Okay. This has been part of a long, yep. ongoing process Agreed. of which how you might implement it physically is being rolled out more so to the public tonight uh, to some extent, some of us tonight, because some others of us have been on scope and design. Mm -hmm. But there's an awful lot that has happened. Tonight isn't a first time uh, for all of us. No, it's it, and, and you know, and again, and I know Howard, myself, and and Jackie, and and Lisa, we have you know, we haven't spent and to give credit a lot of people in this room probably you know close to 80 to 100 hours in addition to the additional time that people have spent putting this together and going through some of your questions, you know, with scope and design. But with that, you know, we do want to get through the presentation. Okay, we're we'll we're getting questions. to the point that we have to sell 40,000 voters on this. Well, That's all right, well, let's, let's just, can we, can we just. Many of our questions first. are going to be answered in the presentation. Okay. Can we just let them finish yeah. it and then we'll ask okay. questions. So uh, first, uh, you know, this should say Lone Pine at West Hills, so sorry about that. Um, and a change order, Howard. So this is, uh, this is a conceptual design. Once the bonds pass, we get into schematic design, design development, construction documents, then we bid, then we let contracts, then we award contracts, then we have um, what's called a change order in the field once something is discovered or once we make a change after all of that. So we're, we're far from a change order. Um, so at Lone Pine at West Hills, uh, create secure entry vestibules, uh, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, classroom architectural improvements, security upgrades, roof replacement, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, technology infrastructure, audio visual systems, update classroom technology, furniture replacement, barrier free playground, and construct sensory room. Question? Um, on the Lone Pine and Eastover schematics. Could you pull I'm your not, mic down? Sorry. On the Lone Pine and Eastover schematics, I'm not seeing a STEM space like we did for the way in Conant spaces. Is that, is that part of the plan for Lone Pine um, and Eastover as well? So we haven't talked about Eastover yet. Uh, you mean East Hills? East, yeah. yeah. Sure. Sorry. It, it goes, goes to the elementary schools making sure it's apples to apples. Correct. So and I think it, some of the things that we've discussed um, with, with architects, when you uh, again, when you look, there's some areas that aren't really labeled here on the East Over at East Hill site, elementary school. It's mislabeled up there. Um, if you look at that heavy renovation area that's the current office, mm -hmm. that space that has not been dedicated to, to something right now. And additionally, when you get into uh, the current locker room facilities that we have, uh, those wouldn't necessarily be needed, but your upper lo locker room that's that's easily accessible could it's it, as a shell could be a, a large space and whether that is stem or storage or whatever would be the best use of that space um, that's an example within East Hills um, and some of those collaboration spaces that were developed when fourth grade moved over to East Hills um, would still be existing spaces similarly with West Hills um, when you look at some of those interior classrooms that were built <coughs> during the, the, the height of the Cold War that have no windows to the exterior uh, you can get into when we're talking about um, uh, sprinkling buildings and whatnot uh, you it opens up possibilities as to taking down walls and creating larger spaces so some of that darker blue area right in the middle of of the heart of west hills there would be some of that collaboration slash stem okay, space that would be Sam. similar there was yeah, a lot of discussion um, at scope and design and elsewhere regarding equity that the students on the south side of the district have the same opportunities and facilities as students on the north side and east side, west side, however you want to look at it. And I like the way that we've juxtaposed this to north and south, by the way. But so <laughs> equity in that regard um, has been uh, a large, large consideration by these guys. Yeah, equitable opportunities became one of those, those charges that we had because you're not going to make things look the same, but, but having some equitable opportunities 
Yeah, yeah and just <coughs> emphasize, and Mark went into a little bit, so the scope and design was made up, you know, of course it was educators, parents, but it was made up of a subset of people from across the district. So the east side is represented the central, the west, so, you know, making sure there were voices in the room to represent everybody. Correct, and our first four meetings were two plus hours, and it was a lot of like, well, what about this or what about that? Did you think about this? And that fifth meeting when we came together as a group and had this design, as we went through this within 15 minutes, we had a bunch, everyone, everyone's thumbs went up and said, okay, what are the next steps? What's the next part of the process? So it was clear that we had found um, the way to best <coughs> utilize the assets that we have, um, you know, and, and, and hit many of the points that I think Mark uh, talked about as far as having that large enough cohort size to continue to populate classes and offer opportunities, um, all of those pieces, so I think so similar to West uh, to East Hills, we're moving Lone Pine to West Hills, but we are not doing any additions. Correct. The square footage is is ample, and okay. and um, you know even looking at potential for some of the the specific classrooms that we would need for special education, uh, we have space for those within the the West Hills and East Hills buildings that again would be Lone Pine Elementary and East Over Elementary. Okay. So Middle School North, some people know it as Losser. Um, this is just a conceptual image of, of what things could look like with the academic uh, wing to the right and um, what would be the administration offices to the left. And that's actually kind of using the same area that the current front doors are located at as the actual front doors. Um, a lot of additions here, obviously, because uh, the academic part of the building was torn down but create secure entry vestibule, learning community additions, second floor addition prep. It's important to know that, you know, looking forward, if, if this was to go through with, you know, about 620 kids, we would have three wings, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It would be constructed so we could put on a second floor. So if we ever had a population increase, we could increase the size of the building. If we had a dramatic middle school population decrease, um, you could elect to build there and shut down the South Middle School. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. That could be 25 years from now. Who knows? But it's easy to put that kind of flexibility in as we construct that um, those academic <coughs> wings. Cafeteria and Commons additions. Uh, robotic stadium. We actually had a graphic on here that showed that as an addition. We think now that we can, um, through a schematic and design development, get the robotics area um, possibly in a different part of the building in that common space, the knowledge mall, maybe the media center. There's just a lot to think about with those spaces. How many, and, and how big would that, I mean, could it hold like all of our robotics teams in the district? I mean, how big are we looking there for the robotics stadium? Um, I don't know until we actually, you know, work with the robotics groups and we, we get some finite detail um, because our thinking on this has changed recently and just trying to not overbuild space and have wasted space. Um, the natatorium addition, and that is an eight-lane uh, starting block, uh, diving well pool, competition pool. Um, renovate existing spaces, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, security upgrades, roof replacement, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, technology and infrastructure, audio-visual system, classroom technology, and furniture replacement. Trying to remember the configuration of the building is with an auditorium added. Is that is the swimming pool currently with the media center? Is that on the graphic? Currently, it's labeled as the media center. All right, so that would be filled in and totally reconfigured. That's correct. Okay. And I think it's worth pointing out here too. If you notice on the auditorium and field house, uh, secure independent entryways as well. So you can utilize the auditorium throughout the day for community ed programs, um, and it would be completely secure from the rest of the building and having access to the hallways where students would be conducting class. This is you. Yeah, this is pretty exciting stuff here. Um, in looking at, uh, we're talking about the Bloomfield Hills Middle School site right now, and that would become Bloomfield Hills Middle School South, or however it's named. Um, and when you look at, I had mentioned previously in this presentation, the multi-purpose auditorium or uh, I think that's how we worded it, right? We've gone through many different 
it's a cafetorium, the auditoria, I don't know, it's a multi-purpose auditorium. So this conceptual drawing is pretty exciting when you look and see what it could look, what our students would have access to. Uh, so this would serve during the day, it would, during the middle of the day, it would serve as a cafeteria. And it's tiered seating, so there'd be three different levels that are all um, ADA compliant, accessible, uh, and it could quickly transform into an auditorium where you have a stage that uh, would be very comparable to the stage that would be available at the North Middle School in the existing auditorium. So again, when we get into that concept of equitable opportunities, it doesn't have to look the same, but a student in theater at Bloomfield Hills Middle School South would be on a newly constructed stage in the multi-purpose auditorium, and a student at North would be in the existing Old Lasser High School auditorium that's renovated on, on a, a stage that was once upon a time a high school stage. Is this to add to what's not on here? You guys have looked at not just the interior, but the exterior, because there were some schematics that also showed there will be a similar football field to what's at Lasser will be at BH, and similar baseball field, and all the outdoor stuff will also be equitable at both at both sites. Correct, correct. And, and so getting into that project list at Middle School South, uh, this drawing has changed <coughs> dramatically from when that first conceptual drawing. Um, Howard, you had referenced that uh, traffic flow and that uh, it's come to be known as a super loop that goes from uh, Conan Elementary looping around those wetland areas um, and, and looping out where, where Bloomfield Hills Middle School currently is. Changing the whole focal point of this building, when you look, uh, Court and Road would be where it says Middle School South, basically. And uh, really, the front entrance of the building would be shifting over to the side. And when you look, again, at those equitable opportunities, just looking at that drawing, you can see a significant part of that building would be, would be an addition. Uh, the, the light box that you see outlined there is the current cafetorium and art room, design tech lab, uh, mechanical rooms, that's where they currently exist. So uh, this was a really neat redesign here where some construction can happen and the mechanicals can be built in a different area and you could transition this building from, from where, where the current mechanicals and, and, and cafeteria space are to a new, say, say new way. Where is the current? So if you look, um, the, the, the white outline box on the right side where you see it says admin in purple there, uh, that is where the cafetorium is currently. Okay. And so that would actually be demolished as ah. this other is, this other would be constructed and there'd be that turning point where you'd hit the switch and it would move okay. um, to the other portion of the building there. So, um, so outside of the pool, so you, I see you're having a robotic addition. So if, you're, if you have a robotic teams that are in this, they would stay there. They wouldn't go to this robotic center at Lasser or at middle, at middle School North. Is that the, the idea? You're going to build a space there where they could, it's big enough, or is, is that what you mean by STEM robotics edition? There's still a, there's a STEM lab here, but not like a dedicated robotics space. Um, the district's robotics center would be at Bloomfield Hills Middle School North in this conceptual design. Okay, that's fine. So this would be more like for build, they could build things, but if they needed to practice. do practice, they would all or go to the compete, robotics center. They would go to lock. The okay. Losser site, the current Losser site, Got it. correct? Okay. Okay. Under this conceptual design, yes. Okay. So, in terms of swimming pools, we go from one natatorium right now to two, but there would not be one at B8 or the, at the uh, south. south. Correct. So that we would have to, there would be busing that would have to go up to north. Correct. For that. There would. There would. But there's currently busing going to the high school? Or yes. Do, and, do and the, the middles use the high school? They do. Okay. And, it's, and, the, and the times that they're swimming are kind of all over the place. So logistically, to make it happen for our kids and keep them within district swimming, um, we have kids, I think, swimming at uh, the 6.30, 7.30 times. And so, it's, the, it's, so by adding another natatorium, this adds to our capacity. We, we had a capacity constraint on, on the swimming pool, the absolutely. natatorium utilization, because yeah. we've gone from two swimming pools down to one. Correct. And now this and would now take us be back going up back two. up to two. And then okay. you also get that added benefit of, of being able to offer up community ad opportunities mm -hmm. throughout the day. And this would be a pool that um, I think the pool at the north would be, you wouldn't have your high school swimming coach say, hey, let's set, it to, let's set the temperature to 68 degrees so we can 
keep our swimmers at that right body temperature as they're exerting. It would be a more community friendly yeah. pool, uh, temperature wise. Do you know, I mean, this might be too detailed, do we have any community access to the pool right now or is it totally utilized by uh, academic, by, by there, K-12? There is, K there is some right now. There is, yeah, mm -hmm. but this would expand that. There's definitely. Thank you. Definitely. So I didn't read through this. I'll quickly read through that and if there's any other additional things to mention here. Uh, create an, a secure entry vestibule, science classroom additions, <coughs> arts and auditorium, auditorium addition, STEM robotics addition, parking lot and bus loop reconfiguration, classroom architectural improvements, security upgrades, since synthetic turf install on the current, I believe it would be the current football field um, behind the, the current Bloomfield Hills Middle School, Roof replacement, interior and exterior lighting upgrades, mechanical equipment replacement, technology infrastructure, audiovisual systems, up, update classroom technology, and furniture replacement. Um, it, <coughs> while we would not be putting in a full high school stadium, similar to what exists at, at the Lasser campus currently, uh, we would have a synthetic turf, turf field spec exactly like what you find in a stadium. So. Uh, again, from an equitable opportunity, kids would be practicing on a turf field. They'd have um, access to those turf fields throughout the school day for, for PE classes and whatnot. All right, just uh, logistically, what about all the teams from the high school that use Lobster Field now? Do they have priority over, uh, because they, you know, they've got stricter requirements on field size, goal size, whatever. Right. Um, so I, I, I guess my, it's not so much a question as a comment that uh, the, whatever's being built behind the current BHMS <coughs> may be something that ends up being shared by both middle schools more so than there being one middle school with a high school grade field and Correct. another you one may without. have Bloomfield Hills Middle School South having a football game right. at the North Campus, which because normally the high the school, high school might, might pra have practice yeah. time there and they may shift over to Bloomfield Hills south at that point and there those all become community assets that you're going to allocate accordingly depending on the need so i think it's a very valid point so i'm talking about community um question for the losser site um we had spoken when we uh, took down and sold the hickory grove property about being sure that we would have some kind of a playground on the losser site that would replace the playground that was dislodged when we sold that property so I hope we can find a way to accommodate that community for that um, and my question about the BHMS site looks like the new addition uh, the dark blue there would go into the tennis courts does that mean um, moving the tennis courts it, it actually um, it goes into the uh, bus loop mm -hmm. and affects part of the parent loop and um, I'm sorry that we don't have a graphic for today, but the super loop that comes from Conant and wraps around that wetlands would be kind of like the new frontage to the building because the building is, in a sense, going to turn okay. and face east. And, and I, that's a follow-up to what where it says orchestra. That's the current entrance to the school. So the right. tennis courts it's would be to point. the west of the gymnasium. Right. Right. Well, yeah. right. So when you get in this area Cynthia here. and I were on the same wavelength. Do any of these impact any of the athletic facilities uh, or fields at all uh, or uh, fields or tennis courts or whatever um, <coughs> are we rearranging any or are they basically all the ancillary space out there is all the same I think it's roughly the same there'd okay. be uh, there could be an impact on I think it's the current baseball field at Bloomfield Hills Middle School depending on where where that how far that driveway needs to be built that's going to loop around um, but otherwise, I believe all act, all current um, athletic fields as they exist would be the same. It would, would remain, you know. And by wise. moving the kids around, moving the grades around, they don't need additional. Basically, we're not going to have any capacity issues um, in terms of fields. We, we shouldn't. Yeah, Thank you. We shouldn't. Yeah. And, and for the larger community, depending on what we do with some of the other sites, I mean, Lone Pine will still be there. Itself as baseball fields, soccer fields. That are available to the community uh, to the extent we still have Pine Lake, we still have Eastover, so those ball fields will still be around. Well, and that's a whole okay. other discussion in terms of what do we do with the excess uh, real estate that we end up with in this whole plan. Is one of the later slides, does one of the later slides talk about parking at the uh, at Bloomfield Hills Middle School, at Conant? Um, I mean, I'm sure all of them are going to have issues with increased, but it, it, I don't want to 
if there's a slide that's coming up that's going to talk yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, no, we don't have graphics for the okay. for the parking. But, but with uh, with the super loop, I mean, I just first of all love that name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Put in the I'm thinking that that's going to have corresponding super parking too, right? Right, <laughs> okay. right. And, and, and concept, I mean, that's that's one of those things. Obviously, the capacity of these buildings, some of yeah, these buildings it's is just increasing. a nightmare right now right. when you have a kid that's got a <coughs> recital or a concert or something trying to park. I mean, it's sort of dangerous. You have to park on court and, and walk through right. ditches of water or whatever. So. <laughs> You are you are planning to increase parking? I th I Super think that you would have an increase in parking with the reconfigurations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have the real the, we would have the real estate. Yes. Again, yeah. without impeding on the. On and the again, that real the, the the nice feature is you, you talk about the safety within those parking lots and and by when that super loop came together, it's just fun to say. Um, you think about traffic backing up onto Corton and trying to create that snake through the parking lot in order to to get everyone off the main roads while they're patiently waiting and abiding by all uh, school policies for driving in their parking <laughs> lots. And, um, but, but that really created a neat opportunity there because you are talking different start times with the middle school and elementary school, so there'd be two waves of traffic that, that utilize that super loop in the morning and afternoon. How many more? Yeah, I want to make sure we get, yep. I mean, I'm sure yeah. we'll have plenty of time There's for questions. A lot, a lot more slides? So this is this is a this is a uh, conceptual drawing of what some of those collaboration zones uh, can look like at, at all the different levels that we're talking about K eight. That's a quick one. Uh, Bloomfield Hills High School. So um, as you know, the high school is brand new, right? And we're in our fifth year, and there was a third of the building that we didn't give much attention to due to the budget and what was passed by the public. Mm -hmm. So we've got some work to do there. Security, upgrades, roof replacement, mechanical equipment replacement, technology infrastructure, audio visual system, west wing casework, fitness and athletic improvements, addition of a weight training room, turf baseball and softball fields, and that is part of your practice field question. Um, by turfing the baseball and softball fields, uh, you can use those for other sports than just Perfect. baseball and softball. Um, and concession and restroom upgrades. And this, this particular slide talks about the early childhood centers, the preschools. Uh, you can see, Cynthia, this comes back to your question about Conant, you can see that hallway does continue on and at that end of the hallway there, at the edge of the darker blue, is that little gray area that feeds into the current preschool that exists at Conant which is the darker blue, and then the purple would be an addition onto Conant's current preschool to add, an, add another um, six classrooms there. And that's staggered start time from the middle school and the elementary school too, right? It, it can be, it can be, because you it depends on preschool drop-off times, but they usually have a larger window, so you don't necessarily have yeah. um, a huge wave. Um, I, mean, I suppose there's probably a time where there is a, a larger volume there, but um, but it's not staggered for bus purposes because there's no bus service right. to this. Correct. So that would for be indi individual family drop off. As there. you tweak this, if you could add a color key. Oh, yeah, this one doesn't. I'm it sorry, but this that. slide did not. Um, and if you look with, with the Eastover students moving over to the East Hills building, it does leave the, the Eastover building, which is in, in better shape than the current Fox Hills building. So, so moving the preschool over to Eastover. Uh, with with that light renovation, we can really uh, right. provide. So a just better to reiterate, your Eastover staying open as a preschool. As a preschool, correct. But all the K five students at Eastover would be at right. the East Hill site. But light renovation will do it at Eastover. I mean, it's marginally better than Fox Hills. I mean, Eastover, I think, is the oldest elementary school we've got. Yeah, there's um, there's enough money in the budget to take care of the infrastructure needs as well as the improvements that need to take place there. The student enrollment here is 360. Now that we're going from three buildings, one, two, three, four, bit, four preschools right now? We have East, Lone, I mean, Pine, Lone Conan, Pine, and, and, and Fox, Hills. Fox Hills. And now we're going down to two. Correct. Is the 360 equivalent to the number we have right now, higher or lower? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. This all came from Lisa. Greglack and uh, Kimberly Hempton. Okay. Here. Yes, back there. 
it was certainly discussed and looked into as yeah. part of scope yeah. and design. Because number one, we're going from three to two, but num and we're going from not having anything on the <coughs> west side to something on the central and east. So that means transportation issues that with parents, we'll have to talk through that. As, as we looked at but the But then data. also, there's other questions that we talked about that we'll talk about in the future, I hope, related to um, uh, pre-K, you know, uh, governmental changes that are coming, both on the kindergarten side, making the potential in the future of mandatory kindergarten and um, uh, f fully funded uh, pre-K. Yeah, and we did, and we did what, discuss what is, those at scope and design. Those hmm. were discussed at scope and design. But it needs to, that, that's fine, but it needs to be fleshed out in these presentations. But I also like that it's flexible because we don't know what legislation is going to be. Right. We also don't know what preschool enrollment is going to be. And there are so many other options um, in the district where we can put preschool that would be really like innovative, exciting, uh, sure. that people could drive to, like the farm, for example. Uh, correct. All, yeah, all, farm, all I'm saying is as part, yep. of a, as part of a SWOT analysis, that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to say how we're going to address that if that happens over the next well, three to five yeah, to I ten years. I just want to say, I know we're midway through, but kudos for the flexibility in enrollment uh, increase and decrease. Um, and uh, spaces that will grow with our community. So uh, I love that we're intentional about all of those changes because we just don't know and these buildings will last for a long time. Yeah, and, and, and in the planning when you're looking at that North Middle School, setting it up so you have the flexibility of going mm -hmm. up a second level, yeah, it's, it's much more cost effective and time effective to do it now mm -hmm. and then 25 years from now when we're not the ones <laughs> standing up here, they'll say, thank goodness they put in those uh, that, that foundation for it. What was, and I'm sure Scope and Design went through this, what was the reason behind doing it east over versus Lone Pine? Perfect question, and that's what I was uh, gonna jump in and, and, and talk about here. The, um, the data that we collected, I think it was in 2017, there was a, uh, some survey that went out. We had, a, we had um, like a plot of where, where is the demand for the preschool? And the hot points were along that telegraph corridor and on the east side of the district. And so when we were really looking at, again, the assets that we have and, and the current state of the buildings, um, it really was, it, it became apparent that continuing to utilize Conant is, is something that our community wants because of that proximity to Telegraph Road and, and where it takes you for work and dropping off those little ones in the morning. Um, and then again, the, the, the location of Eastover is ideal as well with its proximity to I-75 and um, and again, that data showed that's where the families were um, requesting. And, and from Lisa, she historically, Conant and, and Fox Hills are the two that fill up right away. And, and I think Lisa has said that you know, we've, we could fill Conant two, two and a half times. But um, if there was a growing demand on the west side, there is space on the West Hills site to do something if we needed to sometime in the future. Oh, sure. well, that's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. And you refer to Lisa's our pre-K director. Yes, I'm, yep. Not Lisa Afro's. Or yeah. <laughs> where do we, where do we currently have GSRP? Um, I think is it's in Fox Hills. It's in it's Fox, Hills. Fox Hills, yeah. So where would GSRP be in this design? At East Dover. Okay, thank you. I did not read this one aloud to you. I don't know if I need to at this point. No. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll have... Sure. So the other buildings that we haven't been talking about, um, Bowers Farm, Wing Lake, Nature Center, International Academy uh, booth and transportation <coughs> maintenance, um, upgrades to security infrastructure and technology at International Academy, Wing Lake Developmental Center and booth, Farm and Nature Center updates, relocated transportation and maintenance center, demolition of Lone Pine Transportation and Fox Hills, and the sale of Franklin Road maintenance building. Go back again. That's a lot of Sorry, can we That's stay on that stuff. slide for a minute? Mm -hmm. um, I have serious concerns about International Academy being called a support building when in fact it's one of the leading high schools in the country. Um, they need parking lot <clears throat> reconfiguration. Square Lake Road is a parking lot during arrival and dismissal there. It's not safe. Um, they need furniture more than any other building in this district and I don't see furniture on the list for them. Um, I implore that this endeavor treat International Academy um, as well as any of the other buildings that we're talking about. 
these are our students, more kids want to go there and there's no space for them. And part of the initial conversation was to reposition a bigger building for that school. The configuration we came out with doesn't have that. So we, we need to do our due diligence for that school and not call it a support building. Yeah, I apologize for it being called a support building. I think on the next slide, I think is it I think this is a numerical. Yeah, but there's no there's in. no furniture <clears throat> and there's no mention of the parking lot and the loop. Furniture, I'm not sure whether that's part of the tuition or part of the facilities, but that's Howard, that's a, the kids at International Academy are sitting at elementary school desks because they have to beg, borrow, and steal every piece of furniture secondhand and third hand from other buildings. We, we've had that discussion and we need to continue having that discussion in terms of the IA funding, absolutely. No, I, Jennifer's point to me, well taken, we cannot put slides up and talk about equitable opportunities without at least um, right-sizing desks and fixing the worst of the worst at the International Academy, I but, agree. But my, my only thing is whether that's responsibility of Bloomfield Hills or whether that's responsibility right, of the IA well, consortium. It's a whole other discussion. It, it, we don't, we it's don't need our to have building. the IA discussion now during the scope and design, mm -hmm. so we can continue with the slides. So can I just ask about the, the Franklin Road building uh, property? If we sell that, aren't we still going to need to have another property to replace it? Yes, um, if we, if we have more slides coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not too many. We're getting to the end. <laughs> getting to the end. <laughs> So on um, this particular slide, because it came up, and I appreciate President Colin that we will not be having a deep discussion about this, but the International Academy and Wing Lake Educational Center, both of those are in a similar situation in which we rent those buildings to either the IA consortium or uh, the center, it's a center program at Wing Lake. So the way we've treated this in a bond that all of our residents would pay for is we've looked at everything from a landlord perspective for building, parking lots, things of that nature. That's why those are both on this separate slide. And then anything else that's more learning environment, um, loose furnishings, technology, equipment, things of that nature is part of the program. And so we need to look at that separately. I don't have the answer for you tonight, um, but I just wanted to clarify how we've looked at it in terms of the scope for the bond. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm mixing it up with the, my cameo appearance. My name's Alex Jara, <laughs> the himself. director of the Bowers School Alan. Farm. Um, and you just, are? Uh, the director of the Bowers School Farm. My name is Alan Jara. <laughs> um, just, just quickly, we did a strategic plan jointly for the Farm and Nature Center in 2018. And we heard three points pretty clearly from that group. First is that people in our community wanted casual access to the farm and expanded access to the Nature Center. We uh, live in Bloomfield, and we don't have parks, we don't have a downtown, we don't have a community center, and the Farm and Nature Center really acts as those spaces. Uh, we also heard that people valued how the Farm and Nature Center become authentic learning environments for our students. So expanding those, and then finally, community activities are paramount for a strong community. Um, this creates a sense of place for people who live here, and so expanding community activities was the third of the three lens that we look through uh, site plan. And so here I'm just really briefly going to go down the project list for the Farm and the Nature Center. Uh, upgrades to security, infrastructure, and technology. Uh, that goes for both facilities and the Bowers Academy that's on the farm property. Uh, the community use enhancements include physical changes. Uh, one of the reasons the farm isn't open for casual use is there's no differentiation between animals and people. So we're able to move some buildings around to do that. Improvements to trails, visitor spaces, a pavilion and uh, expanded gathering spaces, renovated outdoor learning laboratories, uh, reorganized farm site plan, we can execute that and you can see the graphic up there, uh, teaching kitchen and visitor center at the farm. We would be able to install greenhouses, they're actually hoop houses for year-round fresh produce, could be used in the food services and we've had conversations with Aramark on that, and then a therapeutic and recreational equestrian pavilion. Thank you. Um, as part of the strategic plan for the Nature Center in particular, I seem to remember that there was some discussion about possibly making it into an academic center for either pre-K or K, wasn't there? 
in our strategic plan, we, uh, that we heard that and we discussed that and there was interest in that. Um, that was it pre-K or K? I don't uh, remember. Pre-K. It was pre-K. Okay. Uh, Nature-based preschool, there's a, a, right. a movement nationally for that. It's not off the table and it's something that could still happen and we could reconfigure the current spaces to do that, we believe. Is, so you wouldn't need any investment to do that, you're saying? Um, not necessarily. Within the, the initial stages, we've engaged Lisa Grigliak, actually the Moonshot Thinking Team. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a nature-based preschool space at Chippewa Nature Center. Um, I'm just so, saying this is the time. If, you're go if we're going to put any facilities in, this is going to be the time. Yeah. So again, while we discussed it, I believe there is space available at the Nature okay. Center to do that. Thank you. What about the um, um, children's garden playground? No, that's not part of this plan. No, th thanks for mentioning that. We have a children's discovery garden. It's actually yes. the box labeled T. Uh, that would be a space that parents or grandparents could bring their kids during the day, and it's a, it's a natural playground. Playground. So. Uh, no plastic. Uh, that's actually being uh, fundraised for yeah. through donor support, so it wouldn't be a part of the bond. To tell everyone, just I know it's taking up an extra minute, but where the uh, the two seconds about the background of the designer of this this playground because it's very cool. Who sure. donated so, his uh, sketches and time to? You know, I, I spent ten years working at MSU. Dr. Norm Lowndes is a friend of mine. He's the curator of the MSU Children's Garden, and he has agreed and has started a design for that. Uh, and we'll support not just the design, but the integration into how we can use it with our classroom spaces. Is, is, there, is there any, maybe it's on the Nature Center, or maybe at one of the middle school sites, between our high school and then middle school, let's say, cross country teams, and then we do a lot of fundraiser 5K runs where we just, you know, East Over does their run. Um, is, is there in some of the design to have some sort of running path or something that can support our students throughout the district? Yes, so in this site plan, we have uh, pathways that go all around the 93 acres, uh, but we also discussed ways to, to do cross country paths at the Nature Center, since it's so close to the high school. Um, so at both sites, the answer is yes. So they could, they could have like a home meet, you know, like a f official 5K. You can walk the trails after hours, because now with the new configuration, you can secure the buildings, the animals, and leave the open part for people that want to come and walk in the evening or walk with their dog, you know. Uh, so it makes it much more accessible to the community as well, not just 9 to 5. That's a farm. Yeah, That's a farm. About the oh, talking about the nature center, or an official 5, like a 5K running path. Right. So if like a school wants to have a 5K run, you know, they don't have to open, you know, the whole, you know, um, you know, <coughs> whatever. Or, or our high school team or our middle school teams, they go like, you know, whatever, wherever they go, they go a half hour away. Is there a way that we can build that into this? I, I think or, absolutely. Or are we and, thinking about And how great it would it be to think that we had a, a 5K meet where schools from all over Oakland County came yes. to, to Bloomfield and they did it at a nature center. Uh -huh. Yes, I mean, that, that's a point. Yeah, that's a yeah, point. That's a, you know, not only a selling feature for this community, but just a, a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. this, so, Alan, what percentage would you say of, the of your strategic plan has been captured into the figures and schematics? Um, this site, we did site planning for the farm, and the Nature Center not as formalized in terms of site planning. I would say 100% when it comes okay. to the farm. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. This is the part to me where it's like the possibilities are just endless when you see what can be done. Um, super the loop around the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Run around the farm. I, a super cross country loop. Yeah. I, I just want to put this on the table. Uh, Lisa made me think of it. We've had some incredibly theoretical discussions about whether, right now, our tradition has been that the playgrounds <coughs> are the responsibility of individual buildings. Uh, and the parents, and not coming out of district funds. There be, might be a possibility going in the future at some point, once the board has more discussions with administration, about possibly making those district funded, as opposed to coming out of the parents in a fundraising process. Would that be a problem with this? It's just been a, it's, it's just a, a, an idea we've tossed around. Well, it's yeah. taking care of a lot of the issues because they're making um, accessible playgrounds at all the elementary yeah. schools. So, all, That's so the, these are now be built into the bond. Yeah, yeah it's okay. built in. Yes. All right. Yeah. yeah, and that would be similar when uh, Pine Lake closed and the fourth and fifth graders moved to West Hills. There was money um, from the district that actually, I think they actually had the kids pick out, here's three different options of 
of the, the playground structure that could go in at West Hills and the kids voted and all of that. Yeah, so. what, what, one of the things that I know, you know, it's been inequitable is that um, the elementary schools that have uh, a larger percentage of students that can't use traditional playground equipment, the accessible equipment is much more expensive. It so it's harder to it fund is. those playgrounds. So it hasn't been really fair to expect PTOs at it, four elementary schools. Exactly. Too. It's an equity issue, whether yeah. it's, it's uh, building the building areas of the district yeah, or special education versus gen ed. Absolutely. Sure. I think we saw this, right? And did we already? Yep, I think we took care of that. Okay, so th this was addressing International Academy Wing Lake and the Booth Center. So when we talk about uh, transportation and uh, the maintenance facility, um, if you look at this image from 1980, where I have the cursor is the transportation garage. And it was constructed next to uh, some vacant land at the time. And today, that has a subdivision in the backyard. And there's several things going on here that, um, in my opinion, require uh, attention. Number one is the building itself. The transportation garage, the lounge area where meetings are conducted cannot hold the entire transportation staff. So when we have safety and security meetings, we have to break that up into different groups. Um, when we have drivers just on break, they can't fit in there and they have to go out and sit in their cars. Um, the service bays are not long enough for the new buses that have higher capacities, so we can't spec those buses because we can't maintain them there. And uh, number three, the subdivision that's there, um, we violate uh, noise ordinances with the township by firing up the buses at six in the morning and backup beepers and pumping up air brakes. And it just doesn't serve that community well at all. And then if you look at the number two, that's where we would like to reconfigure um, some parent drop-off opportunities for what would be Eastover Elementary School, and that's where the drivers park. And the drivers make their way from number two to number one out to their bus, you know, twice a day. And we, we spent a little bit of sinking fund money there a couple of years ago. Just, it was just some cosmetics to, to make the place look better. But again, the lounge isn't big enough. The office space isn't big enough. The service bays aren't big enough. We're incredibly tight on the site, and we're really in the wrong location. So with uh, our current physical plant services, the maintenance department is located at Losser. If we were to turn that into uh, Middle School North, then maintenance needs to be re relocated. We do have a service, uh, a storage facility on Franklin Road, which we purchased when physical plant services moved from what is now Model High School to the old administration building, and then from the old administration building to Losser. Um, that building is not big enough on Franklin Road to house our main maintenance department. So the idea here is to move maintenance and transportation to a newly acquired property somewhere in the South Boulevard Updike area in the industrial portion of that, that, that sector of land and uh, purchase the land and construct a facility that would service both of those needs as well as district storage. So relocate transportation from residential site, relocate maintenance from Losser site, combine maintenance and transportation facility, the sale of Franklin Road, Road maintenance facility, um, then demolition of Lone Pine transportation and Fox Hills are captured in that number. Would any of our existing sites work for transportation and maintenance, like Pine Lake or something like that? Um, like uh, physically, they they could work. I we would just be transferring the problem that we have with the neighbors that we're currently affecting to new to neighbors. Well, unless it was yeah. <laughs> unless the facility was built closer to the road. Yeah. Or, and the buses oh. were along the roadside because yeah. not that many houses it's back in there. Area, it's because no. it's a big. I, I guess There's another way of asking there. is to purchase. I mean, it's 13 million of all of this, but to purchase a property as opposed to using existing. What I mean, do you know what's what are we looking at in terms is of that, that the breakdown? Is that big plant there? Are you talking about of South Boulevard and There's Updike? a lot of vacant. There's a lot of vacant yes. property. Yeah, yeah, but there was a plant. There used to be I a silver, 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 silver auto. Yeah, yeah. Silver yeah. Silver there. Was there. Yeah, there. That's there, right. There are a lot of small. So is that is that part of purchasing like? How much would that be to That's purchase a vacant residential? Yeah, so I think uh, there's a lot of things. We need to look at it as long as we've got the property. Yeah. Do we have the number? Too bad. Those are nice plans. I don't remember exactly what the number is, Paul. Okay. Plants. All right. But the plants, 
So they're demolishing. Go back a second, Brian. So that number there is <coughs> net of the sale of the Franklin Road property, but it includes provision for the purchasing of new property and the construction, right? Um, I don't believe that value does include the sale of the Franklin Road property. We paid almost seven hundred thousand dollars for that property, okay. and I don't have a current um, appraisal of that. Because one of the things that we need to work through as we talk about selling of property potentially is offsetting the the cost of the bond with the sale of the bond or the sale of the property so we end up with a net number that we ask the community it's not going to be worth that much well that's it, but that's that but then we've got fox hills we've got lone pine we've got um um, Hick, um, um okay all right pine lake, pine lake thank you 199 as you saw along the way, it had all the individual values spelled out on each of those locations. And so this is kind of the summary document that, that shows you where we're at. What many districts do, we have 50 to 60 buses-ish? Yes. Okay. Many districts, if they still own their buses, use bond dollars to pay for the buses as opposed to using operating cost, which is what we do. It is illegal to use sinking fund dollars for buses to purchase. Obviously, if you outsource buses, possibly the, the vendor takes care of it. But we have historically purchased buses, A, and used operating dollars. As long as we're going out for a bond, is that something that we investigate in terms of putting a provision in here for purchasing busings over the next 10 to 15 years? That certainly could be done if that's what direction we were given. I'd love to hear from <coughs> transportation and then with Tina, the plus and minuses of that, because what you would be doing is freeing dollars up for academics taking your, your uh, foundation allowance dollars and putting it in the classroom as opposed to into buses. All right, well, something to consider. Okay. All right. When you look, I think this is, this is the slide that does take ah, into consideration the Franklin Road, Road building sale, and that would bring it down okay. for all the, all the things listed above there. All right. So it's only the Franklin Road, but not the other uh, buildings that we're demolishing in the extra real estate. Correct. 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 Right. So total, so getting back, total we're looking for now would be like 199. 199.1. <laughs> <laughs> we'll one. leave off that point one. Okay. As yeah, an I originally thought we were at about 185, but yeah. I see really. it, it kept taking into consideration Got it. Okay. All, the, all the different pieces and all the different um, components of the district that we've consulted with. Got it. Okay. If we were to take to get rid of the transportation at East Hills, um, would we have concerns about chem, you know, gas in the ground, um, soil pollution? No, all of our tanks have been monitored. We would be fine. We're not selling it. No, but it's... Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> So three more slides to go. Um, so next is picking an election date. One of the questions we've been asked, and of course we've been exploring as well, are what are some of the considerations in your decision to choose an election date? Uh, so what we've done is we've looked at 2020, available election dates remaining include May, August, and November. Um, I am going to uh, go through this and, and do a little bit of reading, which I normally don't do. So in May, uh, it's a special election, and we would issue bonds and the funds would become available, we project, June of 2020. Moving over to August, uh, that is a state primary, and the issuance of bonds, funds available in September, and then in November, that is our pre presidential general election, as we know, and the issuance of bonds and funds available December, January. With the holidays in there, that's why there are a couple of months, depending <coughs> on, on the timing. The design process in these three scenarios, uh, you could see 
would just uh, ladder out right after the bonds are available. The design process would start as Brian went through. It's um, quite complex and goes through different stages. But we would start as early as July with the May election, or in November we would anticipate that being winter of 2021, depending on that December, January issuance of bonds. The bidding and awarding um, is also impacted by the election date. So in May of 2020, uh, we would be begin bidding and awarding projects as early as December, January, uh, which right now is a very common and typical time frame that we try to meet with our summer projects because we try to get the jump on the best price and getting the bids out there. And then in August, it would be in the spring of 21, and then November would be summer of 21. Continuing with the same options and looking at when construction would begin, the soonest construction would begin with a May election date would be winter of 2020. Uh, saying that, I think there are, depending on whether they're instructional buildings or not, um, Brian can speak to that if you have questions, but with a November, then going all the way out to a November election, uh, fall of 21. So not quite a year difference, but I think logically you can see how the timing is making sense. Project completion, based on estimating all of the work and all of the scope that was um, just covered, uh, would be as early as winter of 2026 with a May election, summer of 2027 with a November election. Some of that is just based on summers. The bulk of the work is in the summer, especially if there are instructional spaces, you know, outside of the things that uh, we might be able to contain and keep students safe and secure and, and still do work. Next, I go through just a, a few more items here. The board resolution due to the county election coordinator would be due by February 14th with the May 2020 election. The last regular board meeting that's scheduled is January 30th. And with an August 2020, the due date would be May 12th. And with a November 2020, August 11th. The last item on this particular slide is the election cost. With May being a special <coughs> election, the estimate is about 100,000. Looking at history and depending, it could, it could vary. We've been as low as like 65, 85, but 100 was um, just in the range just based on people I've talked to. So I wanna be conservative on that. August and November would not carry that special election cost. Are, are we saying, Tina, again on the slide, is that when we say project completion, when you say winter 2026, is that like January 2027? So would everything really be rolled out the fall of 2027 regardless? Is that what we're saying in that slide? Meaning that, you know, no one's going to move in, you know, February to, you know, yeah, middle school would, north. and Everyone would be in place the fall of 2026 with just wrapping up details that winter. So school would start in the new building is 2026. Yes. Well, in all three the, scenarios, fall 2026. No. no. Year, year, August year. and November would be um, the summer of 27, so they would be moved in in the fall, fall so for the start of school of fall of 27. So you're saying May election, the other two, you lose a year. Yeah. Is yeah. that to summarize? And we would get started right away with, um, with that construction begins uh, winter 2020. You know, we would start with some of the quick design things, uh, safety and security items that we can quickly pull off, and, um, you know, um, even some site packages we might be able to get started with some improvements to parking lots and bus loops and things like that. Brian, you've got building completion, project, project completion, let's say six or seven years. Obviously, the Lasser site right now has got the least student population on it. So my guess would be that that would be the first thing that we would work on because it had le the least disruption. I would think that we would have this phased in implementation whereby we kind of keep moving the, the kids around as, as the project gets completed, move the kids and then work on the next site. Is this where everything gets done? I mean, all kids get the new buildings in the summer of 2027, or is it phased in it's year phased, by year? It's phased in. Okay. So it's not just, it's, you know, there's not going to turn a switch and all of a sudden, using the summer as an example. So by the fall of 2027, everyone gets a new <coughs> building. It's going to be year by year. Kids will be moving around into new buildings until and finally and, it's all finished. And don't forget, part of what we learned from the high school was also the weather, right? That mm -hmm. 
we happened to have when we were building the high school. One year was the, the historic snowfall, and one year was historic cold temperatures. And so, okay. yeah, those I, things can happen too, so and it delayed it, just my, acts of nature. My, no. my issue was it's not the, the, the date, but the yeah. fact that it's phased in yeah. and not, um, like with the high when we went, when we moved to BHSS, it was all done, and we obviously we had the Labor Day push, and all the kids moved from the two, one school and two campuses on. But this is going to be year by year. But to, br to bring it back to your point, right? So if someone's asking, it's $100,000 versus losing a year. Is, is that right. what, I mean, forget, we, we don't, you know, I'm just that's saying. That's a good point. That's right. exactly mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, that's a good point. Right, and it, once we would have a bond passed, we would also have a very, very detailed transition plan that makes sure that all of our students are safe and well served during all of the transition, because um, those of you who would not have known, we had um, Ed Bratzloff create an extremely um, detailed plan to make sure that we took care of every aspect of students' safety and, and um, programming throughout all of the transitions, and that would be an important part of our plan. Well, and that brings up a wonderful point. Not only do we have the construction timing, but we did extensive PD during the two years of BHHS construction, working with our teachers and our administrators in the two high school, or the one high school at that point. <coughs> do we anticipate um, any work with the teachers to move them into these new buildings um, academically? I mean, I, 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 yes, I mean, Todd's nodding, Todd Bidlack, um, assistant superintendent is nodding behind me here. Um, I didn't know he was nodding, but I assumed he was nodding because yeah, we, we, yes, we would, we would be working with our um, staff as, as we would continue to do. You'd see things like middle school models, uh, I mean, Much we, of we, we would love to, I think, as part of this process, understand what that PD would look yeah, like generally. Yeah, so, yeah. so just yeah. a couple of things. I know you have a couple because of Because that was a left. major issue when we moved from the high school, yeah, when we did the high school thing, because mm -hmm. so it was a totally different business model with uh, the learning communities, et cetera. So, right, and I so. think, you know, when you bring up the learning communities piece, it was a shift of a, a business model or an right. education model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what you'd see is, the and model also teacher collaboration in terms of putting all the teachers together, getting them out of. The we, we can talk I, I, about. We can talk about say, that separately. I, I, had, I, had, I had one of my kids go through three different high schools. It's well done. It'll be well thought. We don't. Out. We don't need to talk about yeah. that right it'll now. Be it'll be fine. But and and we're going to have time for questions. So what I want to do now is finish the slides, make it a net amendment to the agenda. If anyone in the public wants to have public comment, because we're going to have a series of questions that may take some time or may not. Mm -hmm. But I want to, you know, be um, cognizant of the people out there that may have some questions. Rebecca has blue cards. People can fill out blue cards if people we, want to. We, make we, can I ask a question just while we're like yeah. shifting in the agenda? So it sounds like we're going to have to vote on the thirtieth because one of the dates. Yes. All right. So uh, because I think it, we should stay and have the full discussion tonight. Can we move the other two agenda items to yes, board meeting instead of having to? That's I fine. Mean, I want to make we, sure we can talk about this as long exactly. as we well, need to. That's, no, that's fine. We okay. can do that. I'm just, you know, pe people can stay around, and I can have another set of public comment afterwards. But after yours, I want to be mm -hmm. cognizant can of people want to. the final slide, please? But I think I B, certainly B can. isn't really a discussion. B, is Paul just going to tell everybody probably the, what, the, what the appointments are, right? Yeah, that's fine. That won't take we long. Can, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right, sorry. You've already seen it. I believe this is the last slide. So okay. the, fir the first debt levy, um, uh, debt or uh, the tax levies that we do are actually a July 1 and a December 1, and it's by calendar year. That's the tax year. So it just basically follows the timeline of when the bonds are issued. Uh, the estimated millage rate increase is usually what everyone is always asking about, and uh, based on that 199.1, uh, it is a 1.85 mills in a in three series but the vote would be all at once so, so tina to put it in you know something that you know maybe someone not as sophisticated can figure out so if mm -hmm. i have a fair market value four hundred thousand dollar house what is that per year in taxes okay so if that's about your market value and remember we we pay on taxable value yep. without it, trying to explain that if the taxable value of your home is two hundred thousand let's say it is roughly half of the market yep, value, okay. um, then the annual cost would be $370, $370 about a dollar a day. per year. 
Yes. And Tina, do you have any idea where that mill, uh, that number puts us in terms of other schools and it's other school districts in Oakland County? Right. So currently, our debt millage for the high school is 0.9, and we are among the lowest based on the 2018 tax year. I have updated for the 19. lowest. The no. lowest. The lowest. The lowest. So, so this would be about four hundred dollars a year for the next what thirty year? You know. It, um, it is, it is, it, it'll be in three series, so, but generally it is about 30 years. One of the series is a little bit less than that, but it's about a dollar a day for a fair market value home of, of around $400,000. $400, and um, you had another, somebody asked another question I was about to explain, so I forgot what Stated that was. differently, it's a little less than $100 per year per $100,000 value of your house. Mm -hmm. Yep. If and you, you don't yeah. have to prepay it all at once. And, so if you only live in your house for six years, for <laughs> ten years, for twenty years, you only have to pay while you're living there. Yes. <laughs> and let's say that uh, it passes, and that's our new millage rate. It, we're still in the bottom. We're still amongst the lowest. And actually, okay. I'm going to update that chart for uh, 2019, and I'll also show a line with this particular oh, estimate. I just didn't. Okay. I mean, I, I, I just don't know if people really understand how shockingly low our millage rate is in Bloomfield. It's well, right now, well below the next lowest number millage rate in the county. Yes, for, our, for capital related millages, which would be typically bonds and sinking funds, we are, even with that, you know, amongst okay. the lowest and would still be based on last year's yeah. data, but I need to update it so, for 2019. So this, this Tina, do we have any bonds maturing? Uh, Do we have any things that are offsetting that? We, we only backwards. have the high school bond issue right now okay. because we are amongst the lowest. We just have not Cards. issued bonds and, okay. and had okay. bonds Thank voted you. in. Okay. Um, so that's your presentation. I don't mm -hmm. think Rebecca has any public comment. Okay. All right. Feel free if anyone, again, at <coughs> this time. So can I make an uh, amendment to the agenda? Second. What do you want to Second. do? Second. Add a public comment right now. Oh. A reminder that support. support. We can't answer the questions. Yeah. We can't. Yeah, I said that at, at the beginning. We, we can't address. Yeah. We can take you notes. Vote? Okay. We're about take to vote. Take notes. Vote. All say aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. So if anyone wants to speak now, you'll have up to yeah, five minutes to address fine. the board before we go into our additional questions. This would be a great time. I wish you could just tell her where it be. <coughs> and this is the, the only other opportunity tonight to make a public comment, correct? What? This is the yeah. only other opportunity. Unless we have another other one. Well, Unless at the end. It's number two. Three. Ask questions, make comments. We can make a list. And people can get back to you. Yep. Yeah. Maybe we have one other. Or this is just Andy's. Okay. Andy? Hi. <laughs> Uh, Andy Rain uh, from the robotics organization, uh, past coach. Uh, thank you for all the work that's gone into the, uh, the plan. Uh, we'd just like the opportunity on behalf of the organization to speak to the planning group in detail about the footprint, current footprint at Losser that we use. We're very fortunate the district's been able to make it available to us. We'd like the chance to get into the detail with it to understand how that's maintained in a new plan. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thanks, Andy. Brian Granger? Okay. It looks like there's more coming. Hi, thank you. It's my first time attending, so hopefully I'm uh, doing it correctly. Thank you, you got my name correctly. My uh, <laughs> name is Brian Granger. I have one daughter, a kindergartner at Lone Pine, a second daughter who will be a kindergartner there in two years. So this obviously has a lot of impact on us. Um, a lot of exciting things. Uh, really good to hear all the scope, the design, the work that's gone into it. A um, couple things I didn't hear, which I was just curious about. With all this reconfiguration, what is the estimated class size? Is it changing it? Now there's 550 kids per elementary school, 110 per grades. Are we now looking at still four classes of about 22 to 25 <coughs> kids? Is that still the, the goal, or are we looking at squeezing in 30 kids per class. So that was one thing, um, I don't know if it was addressed or has been thought through. Um, the uh, second question that I had. I think that's you guys can do that. Well, I think maybe you guys can. 
I don't know if, Sorry, you, well, we can't I don't know if they answer him or if it's just more of a... Yeah, yeah, uh, no. uh, we'll, we'll, of someone will get back to you. Something yeah. in the area. Um, on the equitable opportunities, I just did note that the uh, South Middle School not having an auditorium just seems a little inequitable um, with the North having it. Now, if there's busing or something of that sort, just what is, what's the disruption in the day? Is that once a week that the kids from the South Middle School go up there? And uh, does that now take up an extra hour, hour and a half that could have been spent uh, or better used elsewhere? Um, the only other uh, comment that I did have is just on the transportation. I heard, uh, what are we going to do with the existing uh, Pine Lake site, and could that be used for transportation as a resident of somebody who lives behind there on the board in that subdivision? Um, I know we would be very against the extra noise. Uh, Pine Lake now, as, a, as it is maintained, is uh, um, at our last board meeting had a discussion about a child who was going through there in a stroller, got uh, clipped by some thorns because of the overgrowth. Um, fortunately, somebody got out, chopped it down right away, but the upkeep there has been, uh, at least since I've lived there, the school was torn down about a year or two after I moved into the area. Upkeep has been so-so. It's not, uh, you know, probably a high priority, but I just hope whatever happens with the uh, current Lone Pine site when it's raised or whatever, that upkeep is built into this, so it's not uh, overgrown weeds and low... Uh, wood chips and everything else, but the structures are still <coughs> usable. So again, thank you to the committee, every, all the uh, work that's gone into it. Thank you. Elizabeth Steig. Uh, hello, I'm Elizabeth Steig. I live on the east side on Lenox Road. Um, I graduated, went through Bloomfield schools, Eastover, moved to Traub, East Hills, and then Lasser. And my girls went to Eastover, East Hills, Lasser slash Bloomfield Hills High School. Um, this is all new to me, to be honest with you. I've kind of retracted from all the basic things that are going on, but what I saw tonight, I frankly love. I, I really think that you need to do this. Um, my one question from the, the program itself was, uh, it looks like, are the, is the Nature Center and the farm and, and the International Academy included with this bond? That was unclear to me as I was watching. But I just have to say, I started, I'm going to show my age, I started at Eastover in 1962, and other than the Fine Arts Wing, which I found out this week, it was built in 1987, was the year my mother um, retired from Bloomfield Hill Schools. Um, it virtually looks the same. It's the same. And it changed everything, I think, when we had to split the elementary. So I'm, I'm very pleased that this plan puts K through five back together in a different building. Um, but to be honest with you, I like it as a voter. Part of that 80% who is not really paying attention, I vote yes. And um, I would be willing to help in any way to talk with my neighbors. I think if my, na I live right across the street from the farm, if my neighbors would like some of those improvements on the farm, I'm sure that would make them happy. Um, and I think the fact that you're keeping the Eastover building to use as a pre-K would also be a benefit for the neighborhoods right around there. So I, I truly like that. I also like the idea of the transportation moving off district properties as they exist. Um, anyway, I'm for it. And I, if I can help in any way, go for it. <coughs> Thank you. Do we have some more? <laughs> Natalie? <laughs> Who brought the cake? Brian brought it in? <laughs> Hello. I'm Natalie Finnerty, and um, I am an uh, involved parent, I guess you could call me, within the district. Um, I have three children who've gone through or still going through. One is an alumni, graduated last May. Uh, she's a freshman at Michigan State. I have a junior at the high school, and I have a fourth grader at West Hills. So uh, I've been around for a little while, and I will continue to be around. 
Uh, I also offer a perspective of having experience with um, the transition that we went through, you know, eight, ten years ago, uh, when we approved the bond for the new high school and moving uh, kids around. Uh, my uh, oldest, in fact, uh, went to three different schools in three years based on um, when we closed Pine Lake, she was a second grader, she went to third grade at Lone Pine, and then she went to fourth grade at West Hills. Um, so I have been personally affected um, by the transitions. And I would like to comment that um, everything was great. She is now a very successful kid, um, you know, in college. The transitions did not do any damage to her, um, or her classmates for that matter. In fact, I felt it was a very positive change because of the people in the district who implemented the change. So I have a lot of faith in our district, in our staff, and in our administration that uh, any transitions that might come from this plan would be executed excellently. Uh, I also would like to say thank you to the countless hours, research, ideas, and collaboration of the teams that were behind the scenes for the last several months putting this together, Brian and Andy and um, countless others who clearly put their heart and soul and so many hours into this. Uh, I served on the Scope and Design Committee and it was so obvious to me that they just wanted true collaboration from all community members. Um, and lastly, I just want to tell you I'm excited for these changes. Uh, my, my youngest might not even get to benefit from these changes, but it is so important for the kids of our district, for the future of our district, to um, bring all of our buildings up to where the high school is, because uh, it's kind of a great place. We love it. Um, so that was it. I just wanted to tell you I'm excited. I think that uh, a yes vote is um, imperative, and I hope that we can get it done sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ellen? Hi, my name is Mary Ellen Miller. Um, I have three graduates of community and a longtime family. My husband is an Andover grad, a family Losser grad, so we fill all, all voids. Um, I just wanted, having sat in your seat, um, contemplating these things in the past, I just want to I just want to commend you on the conversation that you're having tonight. I think you're ha asking each other great questions. You're bringing, you know, really good things up. I know you're not supposed to call out any board members by name, but I, um, I think you brought up a couple ideas that maybe could be included and a couple things maybe you want to maybe remove from the bond. Biggest challenge is deciding, you know, the time value of overall cost to the community by waiting or not waiting getting everybody excited to do so. How, uh, sorry, Howard asked a question, or someone asked a question about, is any, are, are there any bonds that are maturing? And the answer is absolutely no, because for an entire generation since proposal A passed, this community has made its way through by not um, having any large bond debt for our community. So really now is a pivotal time as you look through the pre-K-8 and, um, and other buildings in the district to improve them once and for a while because we, we know we've been behind. Obviously, you know what's going on in the competitive landscape of communities and schools. You know, when Ann Arbor passed a $1 billion bond, I think that took everybody by notice and they did it by collaborating with other, you know, communities. So the involvement of the farm or the nature center I think is critical. Um, but, but really it's a, a, a point in time for our community and I hope they'll get behind whatever you guys decide to do and, and whenever that is. Um, there are, you know, we're offered any help you need at any point in time, uh, but obviously want to leave you to do your business as well. So good luck. Thank you. Sarah Lipson. Um, I'm really nervous. I did not think I would be doing this tonight. I think the presentation was amazing. Um, I have a kindergartner at Lone Pine, and I have an almost four-year-old at a private preschool who will be going to into Bloomfield schools. Um, I think it was touched up. It was mentioned in every slide, but I don't know if it was emphasized as much as, much as it should have been. Is the safety? Um, all of the schools are going to be getting safety updates if it this passes, but I think everybody has to understand what the current state of safety at the schools um, is, which is not safe. Lone Pine is not safe. 
Um, in today's day and age, we need to think about that. We don't want to, but we need to. Um, I just heard talking to other parents, Conant doesn't have an office, it's just entry also. Um, and I think just for a dollar a day, making sure that our kids go to school in a safe building is, it's not rocket science. Um, the technology is amazing. Other schools are, you know, passing bonds and changing their programs to be STEM, and that's very important. But um, I just don't know that, that the safety concerns were talked about that much today. So. Dima? Good evening. My name is Dima Al Um uh, I'm a parent in the district, also an active parent, and uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the scope of and design committee. I have two kids. Uh, one of them uh, already graduated from the district, and he had also the pleasure of being the first graduating class uh, from BHHS, which means he went through the transition as well. And I want to commend the school district for a great transition plan. Uh, my daughter is graduating this year also, so uh, my kids will not get the privilege of going through this wonderful plan. I do want to say that I support what is happening in the district. This is a great plan and uh, I am fortunate to be part of the design scope uh, who that uh, committee that was uh, uh, um, entrenched in the work. Uh, one thing that I really would like to comment on is to thank both Brian and, uh, and Andy for all the work that they have done and specifically uh, coming up with the final uh, alternative because uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, we had a lot of uh, emotional <laughs> uh, sessions. Uh, they listened, and it was very heartwarming to see that they did listen to all the voices, and they came back with a conclusion, and they came back with an alternative that everyone, exactly like uh, what Brian and Andy said, within 15 minutes, were like, let's move on. So as a parent who doesn't have kids in the district, anymore after this year. I am in support of this plan and uh, I really commend the board for going after these improvements. Now I did get a light bulb today uh, that was not there before which is the comment about preschool and kindergarten. If preschool and kindergarten becomes a mandated uh, educational component, we need to keep that in mind and maybe we need to consider, do we have space for that? So we don't come two years from now to figure out uh, we did not take that into consideration in this plan. So I, I don't think we were thinking about that when we were, do when we were doing scope and design. So uh, that is something maybe for the group to think about. I did not think about that. Uh, so uh, just food for thought, but thank you. Yeah, that, that's it for public comment, so if you guys want to come back, I know we have some questions. And um, So before that, I, again, I, I know I've said this numerous times, I do want to thank not just our board members who served, Brian and Andy, but <coughs> all the community members who served on scope and design. Because again, you know, it's, it was a, it's volunteer, people spent, you know, I know the community members alone spent probably between 40 and 80 hours, maybe more so, you know, behind the scenes. Um, and then our board members and, and Andy and Brian, and they did a, a service, uh, you know, a lot of the, the work that went into planning this out. So again, I can, on behalf of the board and district and community, thank those people enough for spending their volunteer hours doing that. And I think it's worth mentioning as well, my colleagues, um, Jason Rubel, uh, Rebecca Anders, Todd Bidlack, Sarah Fairman, and Kimberly Hampton also played a, a huge, uh, right from the start in the, in the planning and the whole process. So I want to make sure that they're, they get that same recognition. So thank you for that. With that, I open it up to, to my colleagues. <clears throat> yeah, we could do that. We can start. Or thoughts or questions, we can go through um, and we can start with Mark and go around this way. 
I don't have any questions because I've been uh, part of this and uh, I said what I was thinking earlier relative to uh, the academics and uh, I just don't want anybody to come away from tonight not thinking that this is driven by academics. I mean, there's the academic need that has caused this entire conversation and while tonight you know, focused on the bricks and mortar of what it would look like and didn't necessarily uh, talk about the educational benefits. It's because those have been talked about over and over and over again as what's driven this need. So in terms of just pure questions, now I've been part of this uh, throughout and my questions have been answered uh, very thoroughly and professionally uh, as the process has gone along. So. Okay, thank you. Jennifer. Um, so yeah, just to piggyback on what Mark said, um, and for anyone who may be watching this in the future, um, it, it's really time. We, we have K-8 buildings that are 50-ish years old, give or take. Um, and if anybody's ever had an old car, as I did two months ago, and you're looking at the math, you know, it, it gets to a point where it doesn't make sense anymore. And this is not, as Mark intimated, this is not a bright, shiny object. Um, endeavor. This is 50 years into the future and what kind of community do we want to have and what kind of future do we want to provide our children. Um, I'm not from Michigan. I moved here quite deliberately six years ago and I moved here because of the school district. Um, I was told that Troy, Birmingham, Bloomfield and Rochester were all on a par. And I'm sitting in Virginia going, well, that doesn't help me at all, right? So I, I made more phone calls, I talked to more people, and I think a lot of people in this district are like myself. We came here because of the school district, and it's our due diligence and our, our absolute obligation to perpetuate and provide for our, our young people today and tomorrow. Um, this is a new tax. Um, a lot, there are so many bonds in our county and in larger Michigan, and to my understanding, most of those are renewals. Um, and so those are easier to pass, right? Because they, they're not gonna be a bump in the bill. This is, and I think we need to be perfectly transparent about that. But the reason why it's a new tax is because going back to 1988, the, you know, the high school, yes, medium-sized bond. Um, we haven't had an ask like this from our community since the 1980s. So I think that when we, we, when we all engage the community to talk about this and what it means and the real dollars, um, that we keep that in perspective um, and that we all do the math in our heads, um, you know, and can we spend a dollar a day for this community, for the future. I, I just think it's tremendous. I wanna thank Andy and Brian and everybody else who worked on this. This design, as I understand it, is at least five years in the making. When, when the high school discussion was going on, it was widely known at that time that the K-8 buildings were needed attention to. And as I understand it, there was a, an overt agreement with the community that since we're asking for some money for the high school, we will not talk about the K-8 buildings for five years. Um, so now we are at five years and it, it is really time to bring us up to the 21st century um, and really what all of our surrounding districts are doing, have recently done, are, are, rec are planning on doing right now. Thank you. Let me just quickly yeah. correct something that you sure, unintentionally please. said. It, it's not necessarily a dollar a day. It's a dollar a day based on a $400,000 home. Okay. If you had an $800,000 home, it would be $2 a day, $1.2 million. So think of it as $100 per mm -hmm. year per $100,000 value. It's a little bit less, like 90 some odd dollars mm -hmm. uh, per year per $100,000 value of your house. Thank you. When these are done, very often um, the organization will put a, a calculator on their website and you can put your either your address or sure. your house value. Sure, uh, and, and I, I did the math for myself it and it represents about an 8% increase in my real estate taxes. I, I've lived in five different states as an adult. Michigan by far has the lowest real estate taxes I've ever seen. So for me, I'm very comfortable with, with this decision. So I wanted to um
again, thank all of those who served on the committee because there was some great conversation and really appreciate the time people took away from their children and their families to help us in this make this decision making. Um, I want to address a, a issue that one of the, our uh, public comment speakers, we in our scope and design meetings talked about the fact that there is no plan to change class sizes. So that's an important consideration. And as far as the pool conversation, we had a lot of conversation about the inequity about having a pool at one or both sites and it really would increase the cost of putting in a pool is, is a huge additional piece to the bond and um, we, we played that back and forth quite a bit and it just didn't make sense to to, uh, to put it at both sites and that was one place that we recognized the inequity that we felt it with the community would understand that. Uh, so it was something. A question I do have is regarding um, our hearing impaired program. So we have hearing impaired dedicated spaces, I think both at Fox Hills and Eastover. Would we be able to get any center program money from Oakland schools for spaces for those programs? Thank you. Um, I, I'm assuming that by upgrading our buildings that our, our maintenance costs uh, would be the same or less? Our annual maintenance costs? Yes, some. And um, you know, the overall square footage remains about the same even though some right. of the buildings come offline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm, so so it might even decrease because of new roofs, new Correct. HVAC, everything. Correct. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think that uh, what Jennifer said was true, that when we, we went for the bond, uh, at least for the third time, I was there at the, when the third, we were, Mark and I joined at the third time, which was the one that passed, but, um, that there was still discussion and when we heard public comment people were talking about the rest of the buildings in the district um, but at the time the cost of the high school and the transportation back and forth and just the multiple costs um, in our operating budget really drove uh, and 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 the terrible condition really of our buildings at that time in the high school really drove that to be the um, number one focus. Um, uh, but since that time still, we did have that discussion um, and it's been prioritized. And so um, it, it's a great work uh, and um, it's, it's really, um, I think that so many of us did uh, come to our come to Bloomfield Hills because of the school district, and we we know that the value of, of our homes um, really is very much tied with the um, quality of our school district, uh, and so that is um, clearly something that's going to be a good investment for us, even with our homes, even with paying a little uh, uh, more. Yeah, we, we, we need to keep the quality of our buildings up. Um, and, and because it, it allows us to continuously improve our instruction. Um, and that, that's something very important. And, and I, I personally have been to many meetings uh, where these ideas have been floated, whether it was BIC, whether it was study sessions. Um, and so um, uh, we've gone through so many different options to really narrowing it to these great options here. And you really flushed it out very well and with um, the uh, color-coded, um, uh, I would say threshold for how much renovation has to be done on all the parts of the buildings. I think this is a really good concept um, uh, plan in, and with quite a lot of information uh, for uh, the point that we're in and not having hired any architects. Maybe it's because Dima was there. And <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a really good um, 
really good job. And so um, for me, it's really just a question as what, what date would be the date, you know, so I'm, I'm very supportive, but what date is the date that we can get the communication and get every, the community aware of, of uh, all of the talking points that we've talked here and, uh, and be able to, I, I would hate to do it three times like last time, you know? <laughs> three times of going and every time, maybe it, it takes that time, but I, I hope that, you know, none of us want to have to do that again. We want to be able to be one and done and um, be successful. So I think that for me, um, it's how do we execute on this to be able to do um, the best job and get our millages, uh, get, get our bond passed and uh, how do we move forward? I, I actually asked our new superintendent, so I don't know if you're gonna ask him to, yeah. to talk yeah. as well. Yeah. I think that it's being a, our new leader, our new district leader, and so new to the game, I think it's really important that, that um, we uh, really defer to his leadership in how we'll be able to get the, because that's gonna be the communication, um, and the community organize, you know, all the, uh, I know you're doing so much, so many meetings right now, but that is going to really fall on your shoulders. And so I hope that we can hear from you um, at some time. Yep. No, I'll speak probably after myself as we go around. So just, so just a couple of things. Uh, I, I obviously, um, you know, know a lot of people's scope and design, so I trusted <coughs> scope and design in the 80 hours, you know, in terms of flushing out a lot of the questions that I have. I think the biggest, the, the two biggest things that I had, I've done some due diligence in reaching out to whether it's talking to board members in Ann Arbor, talking to board members in Birmingham, looking up research on other bonds that went out. I think, um, and I know, you know, in, you know, Bloomfield Hills, you know, a lot of people are attention to detail. I think what we're putting out there in this presentation um, is for other communities who've gone out for bonds is shocking. I mean, it's, it's probably 1 20th of the detail, what other bond, you know, yeah. Ann Arbor put out a billion dollar bond mm -hmm. and they kind of listed out nowhere near the attention to detail that Brian and Andy went through. So, and I think the question for me is, is not the design, I trust it's scope and design. It's in my mind, is it May, is it November, is it the $100,000 versus waiting a year? Uh, you know, the one thing that I've gotten plenty of feedback in the last couple of weeks is, you know, we have a community, at least the, um, parent community that's really ready to rally behind this and move forward and try to get that 80% that may be hesitant to a new tax but you know I'm very very comfortable and confident that we can get that messaging very quickly you know out to them you know as to the reasons why as some of our uh, people in public comment you know if there's a focus on safety right now which you know um, which is evident you know, that's one of the messaging that anyone can get around and, and obviously what's best for kids. So I think I, uh, again, applaud scope and design to do a lot of the legwork that I didn't have to do because I trusted a lot of people on there, Brian, Andy, and our community um, for doing a great job putting, you know, this, this um, great thing in front of us. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the scope and design team for catching me up to speed. These past three weeks have had the ability to really look everything over. And coming from where I previously was at, I had the opportunity to serve on numerous bond issues for hundreds of millions of dollars. So I'm kind of looking at a couple different things. One, like Trustee Banks said, what are we about? We're about teaching and learning and students. That's number one. That is the number one priority of this bond, make no mistake about it. Look at the other areas that are going to be impacted our special needs students who are so often overlooked now have a sensory room and a therapy room in almost every building. That is top of the line, not just in the state of Michigan, but nationally. Focus on arts, athletics, community spaces. And the number one thing we always say to parents, safety and security. Are your children going to be safe? While there's no guarantee, we have to do more than we're currently doing. I firmly believe as adults, when you know better, you do better. We know better. It doesn't mean you do better down the road. You do better now when it comes to your attention. So from where I sit, we need to do something now. 
do best of our community because those safety and security upgrades can be done. One of the first things we can do. So we need to do them as soon as we can. Great, I have to follow that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. Um, well, thank you, Scope and Design Committee. Uh, thank you to um, everyone who's here who worked on it. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Andy. Andy described at our last meeting a feeling, and again tonight, um, of just knowing when the plan was right, um, going through a couple different plans, and just knowing it felt right when you hit the right one. That's exactly how I felt with this one. So to me, we've got two <coughs> questions, really. Uh, do we like this plan? And which data are we gonna choose? I love this plan. Um, to me, this is the one. It's how I felt the minute I heard it. I, I feel like uh, going down line that my uh, colleagues agree. Um, and so, I, I mean, whenever the next, uh, we're voting on the 30th, that's gonna be a yes vote for me. Um, in terms of the dates, um, I, th this will be my fourth bond, um, so I'll date myself a little bit. <laughs> my son was in kindergarten, and uh, I was asked to go to a meeting about facilities, and he, I'm thinking it's to get rid of like this really ugly carpeting in the media center. Little did I know, <laughs> uh, 80, times 10 hours later, uh, we were working on bond proposal number one that actually never made it on a ballot. Um, to me, th this is the tightest time frame that we're looking at in terms of messaging, but we've got all these resources that we haven't ever had before, social media, et cetera. Um, and uh, there, there will be obviously transition issues. We're talking about multiple schools, not one this time. Um, I had, uh, that, that kindergartner <laughs> was the first graduating class at the new high school. He transitioned to three different high schools and he was fine. Um, I had a feeling somewhere down a couple bonds that he might never spend a day in the new high school. That was fine with me. What we're building as a community is something that's gonna last. Uh, my youngest will not set foot in any of these new buildings, and that doesn't matter to me one bit. It's the right thing to do. Uh, I will support um, and would always support it because I know it's the right thing. It's driven by curriculum. A couple nights ago, we had a meeting and uh, at Bloomfield Hills Middle School and somebody asked our high school principal, what was the advantage to public school over private school? And the first thing he said was curriculum. If we don't work on these cohort sizes and get them right sized, we're gonna lose the breadth of curriculum that we have. We're gonna lose languages, we're gonna lose course offering. That's definitely gonna impact curriculum. Um, this is what's driving the decision <coughs> more so even than these outdated and archaic buildings that don't support learning and certainly don't support the technology needed to support learning. Um, we, we make decisions as a board based on what's best for students. And start time was one. We know that high school students that there is absolutely no evidence that contradicts that later start times are better for high school students. It's there. So I know that change is tough and I know that there will be pushback because of it, but it's the right thing to do for students. We know that this bond is the right thing for students. I personally um, think we can't wait. We should put it on the May ballot I think that because we know it's right, we have to do it um, and push back or not. That's not how we make decisions. We make decisions based on what's right for students. So uh, for me personally, it would be yes to this plan. Awesome, I love it. And let's do it as soon as we can. Why, why wait? In reviewing the material that we've had uh, presented to us today, 
again, I want to follow my colleagues and really compliment the Scope and Design Committee. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job, done a lot of research, and really, really greatly appreciate it. I fully support all the concepts that have been put forward this evening and uh, would like to go forward with them. Um, but now, what's next? What do we do now? Um, I brought up a few issues during the, uh, the presentation. Um, consideration of universal pre-K, what does that mean? Uh, possibility of purchasing buses. We've never done it before against a bond, or at least not in, certainly in recent history. Um, I think it should seriously be considered that way, again, focusing on uh, putting the dollars in the classroom. I think we need to work through the excess property disposal process. We kind of kick that can down the road intentionally when um, we uh, did the high school. I think it would be behooven upon us to try to figure that out now um, so that we don't have the, when we had, how many times do we have the question about what is going to happen to Lazar, what's going to happen to Lazar as part of the high school uh, discussion. Um, much better to have those discussions now and understand what will happen on all those excess properties, the ones we currently have that we're not going to use, and then the ones that will be freed up because of this. Um, I brought up uh, when Mark gave his wonderful um, explanation about all the research that's been done on how academics is driving this, that I think we need to um, now pull together the presentation material of why this money is being spent and uh, why is this plan the best plan. You guys have all seen it. You've, you know, you've lived at the Scope and Design Committee. We've seen it and the board bits and pieces over the last couple of years. I mean, I can't remember all the diff di different presentations that we've seen in the, and the uh, justifications that we've seen over the, the time. But um, we need to pull that together in a nice, tight presentation so that it's easy to understand of not just what we want, but why we need it. Um, I agree with Jackie 1,000%. This needs to be won and done. If you go out to the community and you lose, you lose incredible uh, trust in the community. You lose incredible, uh, uh, tremendous credibility. So, and not only that, but it's a whole bunch of effort for us to not only get there to lose, but then you've got to say, okay, lick your wounds. Why did we lose? and then reconfigure the plan, defer it. I mean, look, look what happened in Farmington. Farmington did this three, four times, and they kept losing, reconfiguring the plan. It, it's not the way to go. You want to do this right. Um, the, I mean, Brian would know the, the Carpenter axiom, measure twice, cut once. You want to do your homework up front, not, not um, let the uh, vote be that. So um, one of the, uh, and I, like uh, Paul, have done some research, not as extensive as I would like, but uh, looking at some other districts and also some uh, um, seminars that were given by um, the, American Public the American School Public Relations Council that I'm sure Sierra is a member of, um, because obviously to communicate this, you need not only the uh, communication to give the facts from the district, but also the possibly an advocacy group. Um, they are 1,000% in favor of doing a survey of the community. You have to take all the work, the, the tremendous work that has been done. It, nor, almost all the decisions, really all the decisions that happen in this district happen in the administration and this board. This is the one time where you have to get the voters on board. If we make a decision as a board to go out and go quite frankly blindly out, assuming that the community, 80% of which have absolutely no clue of what's going on in schools and will only see about a two mil increase in taxes, we're really cutting off our nose or spite our face. We need to do a survey of the community to understand where their hearts are at so that we can then take that data, and we did it with, this, with the um, um, uh, strategic plan. 
We did a strategic plan with a committee, but then we went out to the community and asked them. We on a strategic plan can make the decision ourselves. In this, the community makes the decision, not us. Again, what I found out from the public uh, relations organization is that the minimum timeline you want to do on these things, to do it right and be successful, is six months. And there have six month timelines as to how to do it. If you do it in a shorter period of time, the, the risk of losing increases substantially. Why in the world would we want to do that? <coughs> I, if I go for something, I want to be successful. I think that's what this district wants to do. We have history about what happened with the high school. We had 10 years of it. We want to be one and done. So I really would like to do that survey. And then after we see what that survey says, then we reevaluate potentially or then make a decision on the timing of when we go for the bond. It's, it's our job to come up with what it, we think is best for the district. That's what we were elected here to do. And then it's the administration's job, not necessarily, not to advocate, but to provide the community with the information so the community can be fully informed. Um, beyond that, it's the community to then come back and decide what, what do they want. And uh, just to share some rumblings I've heard around the community that uh, a lot of people who participate in scope and design have shared this with their friends. I've heard a lot of positive feedback. I uh, understand there was a group that got together last week that is starting to get organized because they're very enthused about this and that they're meeting to share this with their neighbors and friends and that there's another meeting this coming Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, which I understand people are more than welcome to attend. All right, can I also just, I want to clear up a couple of things. Uh, you know, Howard, I'm sure you didn't mean to imply that 80% has, when you <coughs> said they have no clue what's going on in the schools, I mean, 80% uh, may not have children in the schools, but certainly that does not mean they have no clue about what's going on in the schools. Very, just clearing up what you very, said. Very limited exposure. No, I don't agree with that either. Well, okay, so le then also I don't agree that this is the only decision the community gets to weigh in and or, or votes on. Every single decision we make as a board should have the community in mind, whether they're he voting at a ballot or whether they're par parents in the school district or a not. Directed, we are representing Representatives of the entire community, Agreed. and we have to take and should be taking them to, into account Agreed. in every single decision Agreed. we make. Agreed. Okay, so just be careful. But they have a they have a vote on this. They on these other issues, they only vote. Based well, on they voting have a vote, and, and that's who's but, sitting at this but, table. Let me, let me just. All right, so and there are three we all. Of us in the eighty percent on this board. I'm sorry. Yeah. There are three of us. In the yeah, yeah, that's percent. Howard. That's offensive, okay. really. Okay. It is. No, I, let's, I, let's, I, I think <laughs> the point the point we wanted to go around express. I have any other questions for Brian and Andy? We didn't have, so yeah, guys have done a real thorough job. Really Go good. around. We do have a couple more weeks till our meeting on the 30th, where we will vote mm -hmm. on the 30th to put, a, you know, whether or not we're going to put a resolution mm -hmm. on the ballot in May, because we need to do that by February 12th. So. And I, I, I would like to say for everybody who lives in Bloomfield School District, um, it, I don't know if, if it's going to be May. I don't know if it should be May. Frankly, personally, I'm quite torn between two different arguments that sound very logical, but I want to put it out there that if it is May, we don't have a second to spare, and we are relying on everyone in this room, everyone in Starbucks, everyone who goes anywhere or does anything in this community to garner support for this initiative, which I think no one would logically argue is not a good idea right so we just we we knowing that we may be under the gun with time if it goes for may um i'm i'm entreating our community to really come out and and support this and and spend time talking to neighbors friends um anywhere you go and whatever you do that's that's how I, we get things done i think I, wanna, I, I also want to say that just to make sure there aren't any rumors I wanted to reiterate what Cynthia said, that the Scope and Design Committee did, did discuss class sizes and they are keeping the class sizes the same. I just want to make sure that doesn't get misconstrued because well, it was just a question. Yeah. Clear up, 
their class sizes are going to be kept the same except for the cohort sizes like band which hopefully will expand so we can keep those I mean that's really the reason okay, we're here. Okay let me say to become they're not going to right increase size. sorry let me say that they're they it because Core academic asking, classes. I, yeah, I, right. I think the one thing, because this is being videotaped and this will obviously be right. posted on various social media. So one of the things, whether we do it in May or wait or not wait, the one thing that this board does want and will pivot on very quickly, as I know Andy and Brian did in this presentation when, you know, probably a week ago, you know, one of the questions I had was an itemized of what all the buildings would cost. And I know that, you know, you can't do something like that in five minutes. So you guys obviously work endless hours putting this together. We do welcome feedback. You know, there is a scope and design, you know, on our website, which will be posted out on social media and blasted out very quickly to the community. And we do welcome all feedback, all questions, and to the best we can, we will get those questions answered mm -hmm. sooner rather than later, getting to your mm -hmm. point, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to, one, uh, sh I will share a document that I received a few days ago from this public relations, a school public relations organization, which has some sample timelines. So I'd like everyone, including the superintendent, to have a copy of that. Um, and then also I would request that prior to or for our, our next meeting that um, we have the uh, administration do some research in terms of what would a survey of the community look like, how much would it cost, how long would it take, what would the content be, um, and could that fit within the, the May timeline? Um, and does it give us enough time to react and change the plan if we find some negative feedback potentially or some tweaks to the plan? Um, and if it doesn't provide us enough time, then um, we sh I, I think we should consider the August or uh, uh, November uh, I, I timeline. think that we should broaden that I think that what we want to have what we would like to see is some draft plans on the different dates and a recommendation of the dates I think that's what I would rather okay. see yeah so right. yeah, not not be prescriptive about the but survey what, what? but say we would really like to see what would a launch plan yeah what would a launch plan execution plan for every date okay. and what is your recommendation for when we go I think okay. that's appropriate okay. Very good. and I, I just also want to say because I know people are watching uh, that it, uh, as part of a school district we are not allowed to advocate True. for a bond okay. so uh, Mark's talking about an advocacy group he can't tell you where or, or can't give you the details necessarily on the di on the website but uh, it, it isn't that um, it's not that and, and school board members can, true. We just can't use school district channels to communicate that. So we, we can and will be, uh, you know, it, depending on. I, I this what, this what, document what, I'm going to send you very right. clearly defines what, you know, a school district can do when an advocacy yeah, group Tina right. has, and we could, we could circulate, she has a whole a book that our, our attorneys have, what are the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Well, I just don't um, want people to think there's yeah. meetings yeah. and yeah. The, that they don't have enough information. Why didn't we say where they were? Right. So for know. the community's knowledge, that, uh, just to piggyback on what Lisa's saying, no one who is paid by our district is allowed to advocate for this bond. They can give it for Except for the superintendent. Except, except Mr. Watson. Um, they can give information all day long, but no do oh, this, yes. do that opinion. So it is really up to us, the volunteers, um, to get this done. Um, this is a private citizen grassroots effort. Um, so there will be no advocating for this in district um, communication right. channels. So that's why if just like you said, if you don't feel like you know what's going on, it's because it, it can't the organization, the grassroots, the political action cannot take place with district resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this do's and don'ts school are again, Tina has this. Can we post that? We can um, post it, we can circulate that. I could probably okay. give my handout out, you know, to people in the public. Uh, maybe we can't because it's copyrighted. But well, anyway, we'll, we'll get okay. the actual act and put it okay. on. Or we can talk with, to with, <coughs> with that, do, does anyone have any more comments? I'm going to move on. So to, is this presentation okay. going to be on the website, or there, this board meeting will be This will be. This is videotaped. On the website. It'll be on the website. Thank It'll you. be posted. Mm -hmm. It'll be posted to our bond website, which 
finally, hopefully, we got the link right, you know, so it won't be changed. So if I post it out, it's going to be that same link over and over again, so people don't have to repost a different link. So I know it was a problem today that it was closed, and then I got a different site. So hopefully, that link will be the link going forward. All right, Paul, um, before we're off this topic really quickly, okay. so can you just tell us uh, for our meeting on the 30th, is there going to be two votes? One for the uh, one, do we like the plan? Two, do we like? Which date do we like? Yeah, we're gonna so we're gonna break it up into two. It's do right. we like the plan? Right. You know, the high level plan that could be tweaked, as Andy and Brian said, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna vote for a resolution. Date. The date. Okay, okay. And, and then does everybody feel like we've had enough discussion that we're we're ready to make uh, individually that we can make vote? I mean, because I'd like to talk about it as much as we need to yeah. before we move on. Unless I was gonna ask, I want to make sure questions. we're ready. Yeah, yeah I was gonna we're ready to be able to vote. On. I think I think that night we'll have okay. plenty of time for discussion. I think we have the Google. You know, if people have additional questions that haven't been answered tonight, or reemphasize questions, whether it's from the community or our board members put it in the doc, and I think. Pat and his team have gone in there best they could, try to answer it. I think the deck, I think, you know, the idea, we're not gonna have all the questions answered. No, but, we're not we gonna have, it, but, but with one of the dates, we have to make a vote, so. We have to make a vote, yeah, so I, I, the point of that question is, what questions do we have so we can make an educated decision mm -hmm. on voting to put it on in May? Just, and as, as, as for each individual. And as I've said, without the survey data, we're putting the cart before the horse. To me, you have to have the survey data, find out what the community feels, and then you vote. Then you decide on the election date. So you're not going to Otherwise, you're, date, otherwise you're, you're, you're doing it backwards. I, well, I, no, I think you're clear. And I think, you and I, they elected us. Our, no, I, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to, I this think, is totally I think Howard made his point clear. Pat took some notes in terms of what's the follow-up for the next meeting. We'll do that. So with that, unless well, there's wait, any. Well, I just want to make sure. We, we went around specifically to talk for every board member yep. and Mr. Watson to talk and everybody said that they were supporting <coughs> this. So I think we have a consensus that we're all supporting this with some tweaks here and there. Oh, um, support the plan. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was clear from, that was the reason you did it, right? Yeah, we did that. And yeah. also, and I think some people actually went further and probably emphasized whether they supported a May date as of now. I right. think some people need some more clarity till mm -hmm. the 30th but by the 30th we'll have mm -hmm. between the google doc and questions we'll have that clarity and we'll vote on it right. either I'm, we'll either four of us at minimum will move it forward or we'll, mm -hmm. we won't i'm just well, wondering uh, mr watson i put some issues on the table yes. universal pk yes. mm -hmm. purchasing buses excess property mm -hmm. i would like to see over the next couple of weeks i think you know we brought it up and it was even brought up in right we'll get those answers that we can get those answers and we'll send them out to the whole means. board so everyone yeah. has the and, exact same and information in terms of whether we roll it mm -hmm. in how much it is and do we roll mm -hmm. it in or Correct. leave it outside all right yes. and since we're doing that uh on behalf of uh, the teachers and teachers union can we uh, get if we feel like there's going to be a reduction in staff i would like to get a heads up on that too mm. no problem good question mm -hmm. yep yes okay so all right yeah, you know, for, for that. Okay, so I'm going to close this part, and we're going to move on to the last part. It's just really me, just kind of the uh, board committee appointments. Mm -hmm. So we have, based on, we had a document that went around asking for feedback on who wanted to be on what based on time constraints, and this mm -hmm. is what uh, came about um, for, for our instructional committee. Jennifer will be the chair, along with Jackie and Cynthia, for the finance and legal committee of FLA. Howard will be the chair with Lisa and Mark on that. For the policy committee, Lisa will be the chair with Howard and Jennifer on that. And the legislative committee, will be Howard will be the chair and Cynthia will be on it as well. Okay. Um, with that, um, adjournment? Yes, adjourned. <laughs>